This story starts back in 2017, when my boyfriend and I first started living together. Rent in our country has been really high for years, so after looking for a long while, we decided to emigrate. Our college is very close to the border between our home country and the neighboring country, and in the neighboring country, the rents were way lower. After a few months of searching, we found an apartment. It used to be the old hay attic of a farm, but a rich couple, the landlords, turned the attic into an apartment years ago and turned the rest of the house into a home for themselves. We absolutely loved the place. We signed the rental agreement and moved in in September of 2017. At first, all was great. We liked our landlord and his wife, even though they were a bit eccentric. But after a while, things became less comfortable. The landlord would blast loud music at all hours of the night. If we asked him to fix something, he would show up at 2 a.m. to attempt to fix it. He constantly bragged about how he kicked out the previous tenants after they told him that the rent was too high. When rats had infested our roof and created holes that went straight outside, he'd use expanding foam to kill them, trapping the rats in the process, which led to them dying and decomposing in the ceiling. And most importantly, he would knock on our door for minutes on end, and if we didn't answer, he would stand underneath our window and yell our names, like he knew we were there, but trying to ignore him. Once he even got into the apartment without permission, I got home from the gym that evening and happened to be sweaty as hell, so I walked straight into the bathroom, which was located on the left side of the entrance. When I came out wrapped in a towel, walking towards the living room, he suddenly came through the front door. I asked him what he was doing there, and he told me that he left his key in our house after a visit, even though he used that very key to get inside. The last points finally clicked when we moved out. The landlord was about to move to Poland, and the new landlord was an absolute dick. So at that point, we decided that it was time to go. We told him about this, and he said, Well, can you return my camera then? We thought he was just joking, but after he left, we suddenly felt very weird about it, so we decided to check around. The apartment had a very high pointed ceiling, so we had to use a ladder. But there, clear as day on the high horizontal beam, we found a small camera pointed at our living room. I think I still have the video somewhere of my boyfriend cutting the wire. One of the creepiest and most off-putting things was that right after the wire was cut, we noticed that one of the Wi-Fi networks around us just disappeared. It was called Cam Network, and it had been active during the entire time that we lived in this apartment. By the time we moved out, we had thought about pressing charges, but we knew that this man had a great lawyer, and he was also long gone by that point. I really do need to say, landlord, let's not meet ever again. The fact that we were likely recorded for our entire stay really rattles my soul, and not having any recourse only makes that feeling even more pronounced. Me and my boyfriend have friends around the area that have attempted to do what we did, find cheaper accommodation a country over. One couple that we know recently reached out our way because they were attempting to rent in a building that was managed by an individual that had the same name as our previous landlord. It's a fairly common name where we're from, but it still makes me wonder. Many years ago, I, 24 years old and male at the time, would hang out with a coworker of mine most Friday nights at a bar and play some pool. I'm not very good at pool, but sometimes after I have a few drinks in me, I start to play well. My coworker was pretty good though. So the nights that I was hot, we would often clean up and be playing for a while. The usual way pool works in a bar is you come up and put a quarter on the table to claim next game. The winner stays on the table, and the new group pays for that game. The table took four quarters to release the balls for the next game. If you keep winning, you stay on the table and don't pay. This particular bar had a main floor and a basement level, and the pool table was in the basement. On this night, it was pretty slow. We played a few games 1v1 between us since nobody else was around. Eventually, these two other guys came down and wanted to play. So we demolished them, in what proceeded to be an uneventful game. 
but one of the guys seemed to get agitated when they lost, although he wanted to play again. We told them to pay for it, and we would definitely play again. And that's when this guy started arguing that he shouldn't have to pay, and that we should split it. We explained how it usually works, and he eventually reluctantly agreed. My coworker and I then proceeded to kick their asses again. This made the guy mad mad. He began screaming at us, insulting us, just all around losing it. The two of us were both in decent shape at the time, so we didn't really feel threatened. And there was no way we were going to give up the table to these guys and just leave. But in hindsight, we should have just left. Miraculously, we actually managed to calm the guy down. He seemed susceptible to reason, maybe understood there was a protocol for playing. We cracked some self-deprecating jokes and eventually fell into a decent rapport with these two guys. They kept wanting to play and we kept beating them, but they kept paying and we were all joking around and doing some playful trash talking, things like that. Then the guy who was angry earlier started to get a little too comfortable. He would come over and stand just a little bit too close to me. He started touching me, putting his hands on my shoulders. He kept talking about my shirt and how much he loved it. It was a boring plaid pattern green shirt, but he would not stop talking about it. At one point, he came up behind me while I was shooting and grabbed at the collar, pulled it away from me because he needed to know what size it was and wanted to see the tag. This was really starting to piss me off at this point, so my coworker and I eventually said we were going upstairs to get some beers, and we just left. That Monday, I was back to work. I work in the TV industry, and at the time I was working at a small local TV station. It was my first job out of college, and I was working my way up. And at the time I was doing a weekly rotation with two other people where we would cycle through different jobs in the control room. That week, I was the Chiron operator which in case you don't know, is the machine that does live, on-air graphics. The ones that come on the lower third of the screen, or over the shoulder boxes, full screen pictures, things like that. I would come in, make the graphics, and then during the news I would call them up and have everything ready when it needed to be aired. I had missed the morning meeting that day for some reason or another, so I didn't know what any of the stories were going to be about that day. One story was about a crime, so I opened the folder that a producer left mugshots in to get it ready for the Chiron. To my shock, there he was. That creep from the bar staring back at me through the screen. I couldn't open up the show rundown fast enough to see what he did. Apparently, the next night at that same bar, he had stabbed someone in the parking lot, allegedly over a fight regarding the pool table. The guy he stabbed lived, but whenever this story pops in my head, I always think about how my night would have ended if we didn't ride the fine line between making this guy too angry or letting him get too friendly. After my second year in college, I booked an Airbnb for a close friend and I that we had been eyeing for a while. It was an off-grid yurt, not a typical stay for me by any means. The yurt was situated on a dirt road, 10 minutes from the main road. To get there, it was less of an address and more of a turn right at the two tires stacked, continue for a mile, go north at the fork type situation. The first night was great. The next day, we explored around town, then returned to our yurt to hang out. I didn't see any neighbors, only homes in the far off distance, so given the heat, I felt comfortable wandering topless around our yurt. When night came, I slept naked. We heard what we assumed to be a distant party early in the night. Loud music was traveling from far away. Sometime along the night, the music stopped and I fell asleep. A while later, my friend who was still awake heard two men's voices speaking in close proximity to each other. The voices started to get closer and closer until one began shushing the other, and they started talking in whispers. Suddenly, they stopped talking altogether, and walked directly up to our yurt, shining a flashlight against the walls. All our belongings were inside, but my car and our shoes, very obviously two women's, were directly outside the yurt. 
They then turned the flashlight off. Up until this point, I had been asleep, but awake to what, in my mind, sounded like a stampeding herd of animals growing closer. I remember being in a half-dream, half-awake state, where I genuinely thought that there was a galloping animal charging our yurt. What my friend later shared with me was that she was pinching me as hard as she could, and that's how I finally woke up. I never felt the pinch, though. I remember gasping as I opened my eyes for some reason, as I was laying on my back in bed. My friend was laying on her side facing me, and she immediately brought her finger to her mouth to shush me. I was now fully awake, but frozen because I had no idea what was going on. We couldn't talk because the desert air carried every sound, every creak of the bed, and I was trying hard to breathe calmly. Since I was on my back, it was difficult to face her without making a sound, so I had my head slightly turned to see what she was whispering. Every minute, the wind would pick up and all we could hear was the breeze. The next minute, complete silence except for their footsteps in the dirt, slowly walking around us. At one point, they stomped loudly all around our yurt, and I realized that must have been what I thought was stampeding animals. It got silent again, and just when we thought they must have left, we heard the faintest sound of footsteps encircling us. I'm a very shy, timid person, but my fight or flight kicked in as wanting to scream as loudly and as deeply as I could, what the f do you think you're doing? And then yell and fight and kick. My friend was the opposite and told me we needed to be absolutely silent. We were communicating on our notes app with the brightness turned all the way down. When it had been what felt like an eternity, she texted 911. The dispatcher was absolutely useless and wouldn't send someone out because we didn't have an address. We kept texting, telling them that we were on a dirt road and all we had were the directions that we sent them, and begged and begged for them to send someone out. We didn't want the men to know we were on a phone because the screen's brightness was still bright against the complete darkness, so we just gave up on texting. I hated myself for not wearing pajamas, for not having all my self-protection tools under my pillow, and instead in my bag on the floor. I remember completely accepting that I may get stabbed. I thought about what it would be like for my family to find out that I'm dead, and how sorry I felt to not explain. I remember in the middle of this eternal frozen state, I heard the zipper on the yurt rattling, and for the first time my friend and I broke the silence and yelled, NOW! As if to cue me leaping to my bag of self-defense items by the door, pull my alarm, turn on my taser, and yell that 911 was on their way as my friend dialed them on speaker. I remember making ourselves as loud as we possibly could, I remember the distant siren approaching getting closer and closer, and I remember packing up my belongings quicker than I had ever packed in my entire life. When a police officer arrived, he waited as we packed up our bags into the car. He said we shouldn't be staying so far from the main road, and we just agreed. It was supposed to be a fun Airbnb, and yet it turned into anything but. As we were about to pack up our last thing, my friend noticed large footprints in the otherwise perfect sand around our tent. They were inches from the tent. Neither of us had walked up that close because to get that close, you had to step over a circle of rocks decorating the border of our yurt. We only entered through the front door zipper where the rocks ended. The officer didn't believe it wasn't ours, despite the significantly larger footprints. He said he had been patrolling the area with police dogs and that that was what we must have heard. I hate that I second-guessed myself for the rest of the night, thinking we may have just scared ourselves over nothing. High on adrenaline, we made the drive home non-stop. We slept together at my house. I was shaking for the rest of the night, and we both slept with stuffed animals, which at our age was very much out of the norm. In the morning, I walked her out to her car to say goodbye, but I froze when I got to my own car, because covering every inch were the largest meatiest handprints in brown dirt. I consider my brother to be a big guy, and even his hands were smaller than the handprints on my car. I was so angry that the police officer didn't see that, but I was also glad that I had proof that someone else was there that night. I took so many pictures because I never wanted to forget the image of so many handprints as evidence. 
The most unsettling part was that my friends shared with me there had been many recent unsolved murders in Wonder Valley within the year before. That happened to be where we were visiting. When she got home, she researched to ease her mind what the area was like and found several articles of missing people minutes from our site. I recognized every road the articles mentioned as the roads leading to our yurt. I realize you may be thinking nothing horrendous happened to us, but I have never felt that deep in my gut subconscious, complete acceptance that I may end up dead as I did that night. It was an absolute gut feeling, and I don't know how else to describe it. I'm glad we made our way out of there. I hate that everyone we spoke to that night didn't believe us. I'm a 32-year-old woman, and I live in California, where this story takes place. Part of the reason I'd like to share this story is because it happened only a few weeks back, and I still can't quite wrap my head around it. While I'm safe and sound now, there was certainly a point where I doubted that would be the case. A few weeks back, I was finishing my day at work. I work a typical 9-5 to boring job in an office setting, so much of my day is spent thinking about what I'm going to do once I get off. Dinner thoughts, what I could watch on Netflix, did I want to hit the gym? Those were all things bouncing off my mind as 5 o'clock finally hit. I stroll out to the parking lot after saying goodnight to the few co-workers I enjoy working with and hop into my car. My office is about a mile away from the freeway that I need to take to get home. And because I've been at this job for years already, I can more or less do this stretch of the drive on autopilot. I pull out into traffic and start my journey home. At the first red stoplight, I fiddle with the radio trying to find a suitable soundtrack for the 15 or so miles between work and my front door. The second red light, I can just about see my on-ramp. But in between the second and third stoplights that I go through, something catches my eye in my rearview mirror. There's a black sedan sort of weaving in and out of both lanes on my side of the road. Like I said, I live in California and terrible drivers are absolutely nothing new to me. I take notice of the fact that this driver is roughly five or six cars behind me at this point. Just a mental note before I continue on my way. I make the right turn onto the freeway, and I'm pleasantly surprised to see that traffic is not terrible. Seems like it's going to be smooth sailing home, which is wonderful. But as I make my way from the right lanes to the left, I see that that same black sedan that was weaving on the surface streets has made its way onto the freeway too. It's not a big deal. But at this point, I kind of just want to let this person who's in an obvious rush pass me by so that they can go about their way and I can be on mine without having to worry about being sideswiped or rear-ended by a destructive driver. I can see them in my mirror, speeding up and down as they move between the other cars on the interstate. They're in the lane directly to my right, and as I lose sight of them in my rear view, I can only assume that they're set to pass me. Great. Get it over with. But as this car pulls up next to me, the driver, a guy who looks like he's in his mid to late 20s, short cut hair, darker complected, kind of just begins to hover next to me. It's like he's let his foot off the gas, trying to coast parallel to me. As this catches my attention, I glance over at him, and he's just staring through the passenger side of my car, at me. But it's not like a checking me out sort of stare. It's more like he's trying to study me. This is immediately unsettling, and I look away back towards the road. But he lingers a little bit longer, before falling back a ways and staying one lane over from me. I thought this was weird, and I didn't like the feeling. But what could I really do? My daily commute takes me onto two freeways. The one I'm on right now leads me to the smaller highway that takes me to my home. This means in about two miles, I have to merge from this five-lane highway to the smaller, less populated two-lane highway that's going to get me to my house. When I hit the junction to change highways, I notice that the black sedan does the same, and now my anxiety is starting to inch higher. It feels like I'm being followed. I start to collect my thoughts and try my best not to spiral. I decide that I'm not going to drive home. If I'm being followed, there's no way that I want this person knowing where I live. I'm going to head to a grocery store or a shopping center, some place that is packed with people. 
Maybe I can get there and get away, or blend in, and this guy will just leave me be. But as I'm exploring all these potential options, the black sedan comes up fast on my right-hand side and passes me, before pulling directly into the left lane, the lane that I'm in, and slamming on his brakes. The car is now fully stopped on the road diagonally. The way he cut me off forced me to brake so that now my car is stopped and completely blocked. The shoulder to my left is blocking me one way, the rear of his car is blocking me the other way. And that's when this man exits his car and begins to walk right towards me. He's tall, slender, and I can see that tucked to his side, almost blending in with his dark pants, is something in his hand. It's a gun. I'm shocked and terrified, and even worse, I have nowhere to go. He strolls up to my window and peers directly at me. I can only imagine the look on my face when he pauses for a moment before saying something to me through my window. Sorry, wrong chick. He then beelines back for his car, hops in the driver's side, and pulls off. Now I'm absolutely shaken, in tears and still absolutely terrified when I hear the sounds of horn honks behind me. There's a line of cars beginning to stack up, and I'm sure that most of them, maybe save for the first person in the line, had no idea what just happened. I can't do anything but pull over to the side of the road, get myself out of traffic, and proceed to lose my shit. I eventually called the police, reported the whole incident, and gave up all the information I could. Other than knowing he was in a black car, I didn't know the make or model, or have it in my mind to look at the license plate as he pulled off. That being said, I've yet to hear back from the cops in regards to this situation. I still have no idea who that man was, or who the right chick was, but I pray that he never found her either. This all happened about two years ago, when I was 19. I'm a female, just for the record. I was in school at the time, and had just moved out of student accommodation into an actual flat with my friend group of six. The night we moved in, it was just me and one of the girls I'm close friends with. Let's call her Lucy. I had my boyfriend over at the time. Let's call him Alec. The other people who were moving in were moving in two weeks later, as they were all on various holidays or visiting home. So it was just the three of us. Lucy was in her room, and Alec and I were smoking a joint in bed watching kung fu movies. At some point, we both notice a man, a six foot tall man, probably around 300 pounds, pacing outside of our window, and occasionally trying to glance inside. We're on a basement floor, but the windows are on ground level. Okay, it's weird, but we'll just make sure the windows are locked. 20 or so minutes pass, everything seems okay until Lucy runs into my room and says, Hey, there's a man in the house. I think we left the door unlocked by accident. F***ing chills. I'm like, what do you mean there's a man in the house? Alec is frozen solid. Me and Lucy go into the hall, and the huge man who we saw looking in the windows is right there. We ask, what are you doing here? He pulls out his phone and shows us a text message from an unsaved number with our address written in it, and something about people being inside. He tells us he's looking for his girlfriend, and that she lives here. And we're like, no the hell she does not. Please remove yourself from our house, now. He says okay, and that he'll phone his girlfriend. He proceeds to make a call, turning his phone to low volume, and we can hear that he's speaking to another man on the phone, someone who is clearly not his girlfriend. With more urgency this time, we tell him that he needs to leave, he needs to get out of our house, and he responds with, okay. He leaves, we lock the door, but we're all shaking. We tell our upstairs neighbors, who we had just met earlier that day, about the whole ordeal. We'll call them Charlotte, Matt, and Rob. They inform us that the same man had tried to come into their house, insisting his girlfriend had lived there. Charlotte already had a boyfriend who we knew of and had also met us that day. Rob had more balls than all of us. He had threatened Big Guy with a knife the time that he came to their house, 
and said that if he ever saw him again, he'd have a real sharp gift for the guy. Needless to say, Big Guy never bothered them again. Over the next couple of weeks, we'd see the Big Guy occasionally, somewhat near our house. I think I even saw him try to peer into our windows one final time. I have absolutely no doubt that he tried the front door again, but it was always locked after that first time. I have no idea what would possess a person to walk into a stranger's house, but seeing as this guy has made a habit of it, I'm betting that it's not to welcome new neighbors with fresh baked cookies. So I recently recalled a memory that was buried long, long ago. Something terrifying that my older sister and I saw on a walk home from elementary school. I initially thought that I had made it up, but she confirmed that what I remembered was true, and the more I think about it, the more it scares my 36-year-old brain. My sister Bianca and I are four years apart, and I had the blessing of being able to have the most attentive and protective big sister, and she has always had this remarkable sixth sense to the point that I've sworn that my gullible naivety that I had at that age could never grasp that this situation was extremely dangerous until now. Going back in time, I was seven years old, first or second grade. My sister would have been in the fifth grade, age 11. We lived in a small town in the South Bay area of California, about 45 minutes south of San Jose. This was an extremely hot day, but we walked the usual eight blocks from our elementary school to our home. Just some info regarding my mom. She worked nights stocking at our local Safeway most of my adolescent life, so we were very independent young girls. We got up, got ready for school on our own. Mom slept until 3.30 p.m., then she'd get up, clean, wash, and made dinner before work at nine. I mention this more for background on the type of childhood I had. It was a different time in the early 90s. Every day we stayed after school for an hour with our favorite kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Marfia. My siblings and I all had the blessing of having the same kindergarten teacher that we developed a super close relationship with her and enjoyed helping her clean up and prepare for her morning class every day. Mrs. Marfia usually would drive us home in the afternoon, but she couldn't that day due to staying later than usual to wait for her husband James to pick her up and take her to the mechanic to pick up her car. So this meant that my sister and I were going to be the only kids walking home at this time. We didn't care because of all the attention this wonderful teacher gave us. This lady was an absolute gem. In the 90s, the area behind my house was an undeveloped lot, a good three blocks long by one and a half blocks wide, directly in front of the newly placed skate park. So from my backyard, we could see the park. Upon passing the park, we would race or run from the sidewalk that borders the park to the back door of our fence, which was my favorite because my sister always let me feel like I was the winner. But halfway through the run, I'm ahead as I mentioned before, and I'm passing through the normal sticker bushes. Everything is dirt and ugly tall weeds that would poke you badly if you got too close to them. Some of the bushes you could hide under, but it was so ugly we usually raced to avoid the stickers. So I'm literally 100 yards from the fence, and I hear my sister scream my name. Like not a normal scream, but she shouts my first and middle name really sharply, and I stop dead in my tracks. I yell backwards, what? Right before I can turn around fully and see what's going on, she plows right into me. She's grabbing my shoulders while wrapping her arm to shield my face from what I'm sure I'll be scared of. This is all while shoving me forward, and I'm so very confused. There's no time to say anything, but from the break between her fingers, I see two sets of legs under a large bush. This is where my memory plays like I'm watching a movie, and I can rewind every detail. I've spent many hours with my sister recalling the details that I had blocked out, but I scared myself with how vividly I could remember what had happened. I witness an assault. They are laying down under a large bush with both sets of legs exposed. I see a man dressed in a red tank top with dirty blue jeans and black boots. He has sunglasses on, and he was agitated to say the least. He was choking this young woman. She was maybe 20 years old, wearing overalls, white shirt, and white sandals. Her face was dirty, 
bruised, and her lips were blue. She was trying her best to scratch at his hands, moaning in pain. This is all I get to see, obviously more than enough, before my sister yanks me in alternate way. She said that she was afraid he'd follow us or see us unlock our back gate to the house, so she took me around the long way. At this point, I'm yelling, I'm scared, I'm sobbing to her, asking her, Sissy, what was that? That guy was killing her. My sister said, we have to go. Hurry, we can tell mom, hurry up. All I see after is a blur until we get home and wake my mom up, hysterically telling her what we saw. She called the police, but we never got any information regarding if they found that woman or the guy. I've scoured the internet for anything about an assault or kidnapping, anything, and I've never seen or heard a thing. My sister cried when I asked her recently about this memory. Like I said, I thought it was something I dreamt up or imagined, but the detail I recalled made her scared that what we had seen had severely traumatized me. But who knows, it's scary in any context. So the man who was attacking that poor girl one day after school I hope you reap what you sow, and we never meet again. This happened a few years back, sometime around November. My mother and I love being outside and going for walks. This night in particular was absolutely freezing out, but we decided we wanted to go for a quick walk. As we walked back home on our route, we went down this one street that we use all the time. It's a neighborhood street that leads to the main road and then back into our neighborhood. We get halfway down the street and I hear a dog bark over the music on my phone. I turn the music down and turn to look for the dog because I love dogs and I wasn't aware there was a big dog on this street. Context. I know quite a few people on this street and I know which houses have dogs. Most of the people on this block have small dogs or even cats. But the bark that I heard came from a house that didn't have a dog, let alone a big one. I spun around and saw a big dark mass just feet away from me. A big, man-shaped mass. In fact, he was only about two steps away from me. A few more feet, and he would have easily been able to grab me. This immediately weirded me out, and I started speed walking to catch back up to my mom who, at that point, didn't even realize I had stopped. I turned off the phone and whispered to her that I thought we were being followed. She turned around and grabbed my arm and told me there were two men right behind us. We quickly decided to cross the street, and when they followed right behind us, we crossed back to the original side of the road. Once it was obviously apparent that we knew they were following us, one of the dudes started to make small chit-chat with us. Awfully late for y'all to be walking, huh? His voice had a very siren-esque quality about it, almost as if he was trying to lure us to something. He continued asking us questions. My mom kept walking and replying with quick replies, if at all. From the sound of his voice, I knew we were in danger, so I went to discreetly dial 911. Instead, my mom told me to call my dad, as he would be able to get to us quicker given the fact that we were almost home. We got to the busy street and looked behind us to see them speed walking right at us. We decided to risk it and run into the middle of the street as cars passed on either side of us. We made it across the street and met up with my dad on that side. We looked back across the street from where we came and there was no sign of those men. They were just gone. We made it to our car and my dad wanted to make a pass up and down the avenue to see if he could find these guys. But with no visible trace of them, it's as if they had almost disappeared into thin air. I asked my mom if she thought that we would have been kidnapped if that dog didn't bark. To which she replied, What dog? I asked her how she didn't hear this massive dog bark right around the time that we turned around, especially with how good her hearing is. I still have no clue what it was I heard. But I do know that by causing me to turn around, it probably saved both me and my mother from a very bad evening, if not worse. About eight years ago, 
My girlfriends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Definitely not the smartest thinking back, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere Pennsylvania. This one night, we met a guy. Let's call him Todd. Todd was an odd guy. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the deep feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Roney's Point, a very interesting place in West Virginia. You should look it up if you're into ghosts or haunted history. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area, while us girls went ahead to explore. Red flag right there. I was so sure he was going to try and steal my car, and I wasn't about that. We went into the abandoned hospital, and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. Scared us so badly, we let out a slight scream. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum. It's right next to the hospital we were exploring, and that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, how much fun would that be? We continued to explore, and Todd just hung out in the background. We eventually left, and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas, so I started driving towards the nearest station, maybe two minutes up this winding road. I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders as I'm driving. I kept leaning forward to give him the hint that I wasn't interested and to leave me be. But as he was massaging my shoulders, he's telling both my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out with us, how we never know who is getting into our car, and how we just never know what their ideas might be. He started laughing again and I don't think I'll ever forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders. He said, maybe that person's in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and demanded that he got out of the car. Surprisingly for being in the middle of nowhere, he did without question, and I left him there. We got back home and my friend went onto her POF to block him, but he had already blocked her or deleted his account. We're not sure. We never heard from this guy again, but we stopped inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. Todd, you were creepy as hell, but you taught us our lesson. Last winter, my brother visited us from Dundee, Scotland with his three-year-old son. Since my bro had moved from Glasgow, we didn't get to see him or his family too often so we cherished it any time we got together. Unfortunately, his wife could not travel due to her own work, and only a day into his visit, he was called back himself due to an emergency. My young nephew wanted to stay though, as we had bought him tickets to the football match the day after, so I agreed to take him back to his dad in Dundee after the game completed. The only train I could get was a fairly late one, and it was therefore the last one of the day. So I took my nephew to the match and headed straight to the station afterwards. The train itself was fairly busy, but I had booked us two seats. Just as we were about to board the train, the man standing next to me made an odd comment. Like sardines, aren't they? I hate sardines. He said this, and I found it fairly odd, although I just laughed it off awkwardly. I've never been good at making conversations with strangers. And always tend to feel uneasy when one approaches me. As we made our way to our seats, I noticed an old couple was sitting in them. I told them they were our seats, but they were fairly rude and told me that old people shouldn't be made to stand for a journey. I'm not a big fan of confrontation either, especially in public. So instead of making a stink, I let it pass, take my nephew and we move on down the train. There were no two seats together anywhere on the train so my nephew and I were forced to stand for about an hour until many people on the train finally got off when it stopped in Perth. When we ultimately found a few seats, we sat down and I mistakenly fell asleep as I was so tired after a long day and standing an hour on the train didn't do me any favors. As my nephew was only three, he obviously fell asleep as well. I awoke just as the last passengers were getting off at Dundee. I quickly hopped up tried to gather my nephew as quickly as possible, 
but he was too slow, and I had to stay on the train with him, which means we missed the stop. As the train was delayed slightly, it was now going straight to Aberdeen, which was about another hour away. I sat down and tried to phone anyone I knew, but I didn't have a signal in the cabin. I began to panic, as I knew that there would be no return trains from Aberdeen at this time of night, likely meaning we would have to find a hotel near the train station. I tried to compose myself and looked about the train to see if there was anyone who could maybe help me. My carriage had more or less cleared out by this point, and there were only three other people left. An older woman sleeping a few rows in front of me, a young man reading a book at the opposite side, and a third man who was seated behind me. I told my nephew to go back to sleep and started trying to plan what we would do when we landed in Aberdeen. With a low phone battery and no signal, this was obviously a fairly difficult task, and I thought I should ask the man behind me for some help. I looked in the window's reflection at him and noticed that it was the same man who made that sardine comment earlier. He was a middle-aged man, fairly average build and height, and there was absolutely nothing to suggest he was in any way dangerous. Except for one thing, he was staring right at me. I looked away for a moment, thinking maybe he was just looking about the train, as I had done only a minute ago. But when I looked back again, he was still glaring. His stare didn't seem to break until he got up to presumably go to the toilet. I debated switching to another carriage, but before I could gather my stuff and wake my nephew, he had returned. Only this time, he sat in a different seat, facing me directly. A few uneasy minutes pass before he makes a comment. Someone's sleepy, he said, nodding at my nephew. I laughed awkwardly once more and put my earphones in to avoid having to talk to him, even though my phone had just died. Must be some set of earphones if they can listen to music when your phone's dead, he said. My heart dropped at that observation. I'm only kidding on you, he says, but I now had no excuse to avoid conversation with him. So are you going home or visiting someone, he asked. I made the mistake of telling him what had happened and that I had missed my stop. Oh my, that's quite the situation. You won't get a train back at this hour. I nodded and said I'll just find a hotel for the night. He then approached where we were sitting, sat right across from me. Hotels will be all booked and even if they aren't, they'll charge you a fortune. I've got a place not far from the station. You can stay there for the night and hop the train in the morning. I'll stay out of the way of you and your son. You don't have to worry. I explained to the man that it was not my son, that I was his aunt, and that I'd be happy to cough up the money for a hotel, trying to stay polite by saying I didn't want to be a nuisance for him, even though I really just wanted to tell him to f off. Oh, believe me, you won't be any nuisance to me, he said in an overly friendly tone. I was now extremely unnerved, but still tried my best to talk myself out of the situation. This conversation carried on for another ten minutes or so, and he was increasingly insistent that I stayed with him. I didn't have any idea what to do. I felt completely helpless. I told him I needed to use the toilet in an effort to get away from the carriage. This is when he grabbed my wrist below the table. You're not going anywhere, he says in a hushed tone. You're staying with me. I'll keep you safe. Gone was the friendly tone, replaced by an extremely chilling voice. I couldn't even bring myself to scream out in the situation. The only other passengers on the carriage were at the opposite end, and I was terrified that if I screamed, the man would hurt me or my nephew. He wouldn't let go of my wrist, and repeatedly began saying, Just act natural. The remaining part of the journey seemed to last a lifetime, and I knew even then there was no light at the end of this tunnel, as the man wouldn't let me go. The train finally reached Aberdeen, and the man told me to wake my nephew, not alarm him, and to tell him we were staying at this nice man's house for the evening. He held my hand as we got off the train, and my worst feelings were coming true, as I knew what would happen when this man got us back to his house. All of a sudden, I was knocked to the floor in a heap of bodies. The police had tackled the man and were arresting him. As I got to my feet, I grabbed my nephew's hand and ran a couple of yards away, clearing ourselves from the fracas. 
before completely breaking down. The police comforted me and told me that the young man who was reading his book at the other side of the carriage had noticed what was going on and sent a text to the transport police, whose number is all over the walls of the train on various posters. It took me a couple of minutes to process everything, but I managed to gain enough composure to thank the police and express my gratitude towards the man who had sent that text. I only managed to say a few words to him, but I will be forever grateful to him, as he saved me and my nephew from what would have been a night of terror, and he possibly even saved our lives. The police very kindly took me and my nephew back to Dundee, where my brother and his wife were extremely relieved to see us. It's now been some time since this incident, but it has had a lasting effect on me, and I always make sure that when I'm traveling late at night, that I'm accompanied by someone and never run the risk of missing my stop ever again. My husband and I moved into a cool downtown loft in 1999 in San Diego's Gaslamp District. We had an underground parking garage that was manned by security after the management team left for the day. My husband worked nights at the time while I attended UCSD. On New Year's Eve 1999, my good friend came to visit and to hit up all the parties. If you remember the year 2000, you know exactly what I mean. I had secured a spot for her in the visitor section of the lot and went down to meet her. The security guard on duty was a middle-aged gentleman. I have long since forgotten his name. He was always very nice to me, but there was something about him that bothered me and I just didn't know why. When I met my friend at the gate, he came to speak to us and asked about our plans for the evening. My friend told him we were hitting the town on such an exciting night. I said nothing until we got away from the building. For some reason, I said, Kristen, if anything ever happens to me, tell the police to check that guy out, not my husband. She laughed and asked me why, and I told her it was just a feeling that I had. She reminded me of this later and you'll see why. A few weeks pass, and I see the same security guard leaving the unit of my neighbor that I knew was out of town. I thought it was odd, because he was the parking lot guard and not security for the building. When I mentioned it to another neighbor, she told me that the guards had the master key to the lofts in case of an emergency. Okay, my husband works nights. The security guard knows this, I get a creepy feeling around him, so that's just great. We added a chain to the door, it already had a bolt and a regular lock, and that made me feel a little bit better, just a touch safer. Later that year, we're watching the news, and that security guard's face pops up on the screen. I pay close attention. Turns out, he is one of the Aryan leaders from San Diego, and he had just been found guilty of some race-related crime that was sending him away for a long, long time. I absolutely lost it. Why? I'm black and my husband is white. I thought back to every time he spoke to us, how consolatory he was, how much he'd asked how we were doing, how he would ask my husband about his job, all the little, seeming innocuous questions he put to us. And it scared me to death. He'd had the key to my home he had to have been bothered by our relationship, yet he never showed it, except to my sixth sense. I raced to the management's office as soon as they opened the next day. One of my neighbors had beat me there. It was the guy whose unit I saw him exiting months before. He was threatening to sue management because he had told them months ago that the security guard was an Aryan and that he was distributing hate leaflets to his son. From the gist of the heated exchange, I discerned that management had approached the guard and asked him about this, yet he denied any knowledge of the pamphlets. The neighbor's last words as he was leaving was that he was conferring with a lawyer since they did nothing at the time. Now this guy was on the news for hate crimes committed. He was obviously an Aryan Nation member, and their lack of intervention had allowed him to influence a minor. I have no idea what happened with him as the neighbor moved soon after. I voiced my concerns to management, and they said they'd contracted with a security company, 
and that the guard had passed all background checks at the time of employment. Why he was even working as a security guard? I have no idea. And being young, we just let it go. Although I've forgotten his name, I can still clearly see his face when I think about him. I've tried looking him up on Google, but none of the search information I've used brings up his case. I've thought about looking it up at the courthouse. There must be some way. But then I think, what's the point? He's in jail still. At least I hope. I randomly recall this memory at times. I'm so glad that my parents taught us to not trust strangers, but I'm even more thankful for my sister actually listening. Back in the 90s, my two siblings and I were walking from our house towards our bus stop to go to school. For context, I was seven, my brother was eight, and my older sister was almost 11. It was a foggy morning as I remember it, and the walk was almost too quiet. We were the only ones in the line of sight. We were a few streets away from the bus stop when a small white sedan pulled up next to us, slowly matching our pace. We looked over slightly confused and curious at the white woman with long curly brown hair in the driver's seat. She was staring directly at us. She was probably around 35 or 40 years old from the looks of her. This continued for a few seconds before she rolled down her window and said, Hey kids, heading to school? She had this weird smile and eyes that looked like they were looking through us. We nodded as it was obvious with our backpacks and all. She coaxed us to come closer with a wave. Why don't you three hop in? I can take you all to school. I, of course, being seven and lazy, was all about the free ride. Sure, I said smiling. My sister grabbed my arm tightly, so tightly that it hurt me. At this point, she pipes up and says, No thanks, rather sternly. The woman's smile seemed to fade, and then reappear in a fraction of a second. Oh, it's really fine. You don't have to walk. I can take you quickly, she said trying to sound kind. That's when I felt the hairs on my neck begin to stand. No, my sister said even more sternly. My brother looked scared, and I was both confused and and alarmed at his facial expression. The woman then turned the wheel of the car and pulled closer to the curb, closer towards us. We all stopped in our tracks out of fear. Get in the car, she said as she halted the vehicle. Her smile vanished and was replaced by a toothy sneer. She was close enough that I could see her dark brown pits for eyes. I swear, she glared at us with pure evil. That was it. My sister picked me up and yelled to my brother, run. I don't know how, but she all of a sudden had Hulk-like strength. She and my brother started sprinting as fast as they could down the sidewalk. I clutched my sister tightly screaming. They almost fell twice in the process, but thankfully, the car never turned around to pursue. Instead, it sped forward and turned down an adjacent street. My siblings didn't stop running until we made it home. We locked the door, and we all sat there sobbing. Both my mother and father were working, so we couldn't contact them until they came home. While we were all aware where our parents worked, we didn't have the phone numbers or know how to reach them. That's basically it. If it weren't for my sister, I have no doubt that I or we would have been kidnapped. And from that point, who knows what could have happened. Case in point, teach your kids to never trust strangers. I know our parents taught the lesson. Apparently, I didn't listen. This is something that happened this past Friday while I was babysitting. For a little bit of context to start, I'm 21 years old, a female college student, and have been babysitting since I was about 14. I'm not an expert on literally anything. However, over the years, I have learned both caution and resilience. At the age of 15, I took babysitting courses at our youth center, as well as a female self-defense course. So I babysit at least once a month for this one family. I like them because they pay me more than my usual hourly rate, 
They have a big house with internet that I can use to do homework. And the two kids are surprisingly well behaved and compliant. So the two parents have like a monthly ritual of going out around 5 p.m. and returning a little after 2 a.m. I'm always offered to sleep in the guest bedroom and stay until morning. But I usually just stay awake and abuse their satellite TV and then leave when they come home. The house is in a nice neighborhood without a whole lot of neighbors. Very quiet. Also, their house is armed with an alarm system that I have the code to and can arm and disarm it through my phone. That'll be relevant in a little while. So most nights, I take the kids for pizza at this place that has an arcade. I do this so they tire themselves out and head to bed early. Plus, the little girl that I babysit is on a mission to win a family of stuffed animals from the prize store. So I'd be the world's worst babysitter if I didn't guide her in that pursuit. If anyone may be wondering for whatever reason, after Friday night, she only needs the daddy stuffed animal before her collection is complete. Go girl. Anywho, I'm rambling. I was sitting at the table and watching them play in a ball pit while also texting on my phone. This couple came over and sat at the same table as me. It was a long table with parents scattered here and there, so this in and of itself wasn't alarming. The couple looked normal enough. Both were probably in their mid-twenties, maybe a little older. They talked to each other, but then the guy asked me, Are you the one babysitting Dr. So-and-so's kids? So the parents of these children are both doctors, and the specific region that we live in, this would be common enough information. But I still chose to answer their question with an irrelevant statement. I wonder what they use to make the pizza here, is what I said. Yeah, I know, I'm a master of deception. I deserve an Oscar for my performance. However, they seemed to see right through my clever ruse. They started making weird comments. They talked about the kid's parents. They commented on the daughter and how they wondered if she would look as pretty as their mom. Okay, my dudes, I don't know if that was intended to be creepy, but I'm just going to be safe and pretend that it was. That's when the woman says to me, and I quote, do they really let you dress like that while watching their kids? She motioned with her eyes towards my t-shirt, which was admittedly a little tight, though aside from a little bit of bosom crack, wasn't revealing at all. I have a thin frame and a large chest. It's 90 degrees in my region of the US right now, so it's not like I'm going to wear a hoodie. And my tits have a Crips and Bloods type relationship with any kind of shirt that has buttons. I saw that as my cue to go and to get the kiddos and bring them to get their prizes so that we could bounce. After some very thought-provoking and philosophical debating, they both got their prizes and we headed back to the house. Fast forward a few hours, both kids were bathed and put to sleep. I delivered a heartwarming rendition of Goodnight Moon and read a very spooky chapter of The Werewolf of Fever Swamp and tucked them into dreamland. It was around 9 p.m. I was caught up on homework and was just watching TV when I heard some movement on the porch. I didn't think much of it at first, but the doorknob started rattling violently. I initially started moving towards the front door to see who it was, but miraculously, I remembered that it was late at night. I was home alone with two kids, and I very much wanted to live. I turned around to grab my purse, which is where I keep my taser. As I'm moving, the back door starts rattling as well, and was accompanied by some banging noises. That's when I remembered that I hadn't enabled the alarm system after returning. Now, if this was a horror movie scenario, of course the alarm wouldn't have worked, and the intruders would have made their way inside. I hate to disappoint if you were expecting something more exciting, but I enabled it quite easily with no incident. I ran upstairs and grabbed the two kids. I put them in their parents' room in the walk-in closet. I still hate that I scared them. When I gathered them up, I gave zero context as to what was going on. I didn't want to tell them that someone was trying to break into their house, but in the process, the fear of not knowing seemed to be worse. I instructed them to stay in there and stay quiet, and only to open the door if they hear me talking to them. I then locked the bedroom door, which is the only door on the upstairs floor that locks. I sat there with my taser out and hit the panic button on the phone app. Several minutes went by. 
Then I got the notification through the app that the alarm system was disabled. I planned on calling 911, even though the panic button already took care of that. But I found it more beneficial to arm it back again. But then it disarmed one more time. So I armed it again. Then it disarmed once more. By this time, I could hear what sounded like two sets of footsteps walking up the stairs. Good job. You locked yourself inside with two potential assailants. I was holding it together for the sake of those kids, but not too deep inside. I was scared to death. When I heard the footsteps get near the door and saw the knob twisting, I took a deep breath and pulled the trigger on my taser, just to let them know I was armed, though it realistically wouldn't do much good. I informed them through the door that the alarm was triggered and police were on their way. Thankfully, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was the father of the family, and I really only remember him saying two words. You're safe. I opened the door and ran into their arms and started sobbing. I hadn't realized truly until it was over just how scared I really was. The kids came out without me giving them the okay, but their parents were there, so I'll let it slide. When I enabled the alarm on my phone, they both got the notification from the place they were at. With the app, you have the option to view the porch cameras as well. When they got the notification that the panic button was activated, they saw through the camera that there were people on each side of the house. One man and one woman. When the alarm kept disarming, that was the parents trying to get back into the house. Police report was filed by them, and I gave a statement mentioning the two weirdos I met earlier that day, even though there was really no evidence that would directly point to them. Camera footage didn't give any positive face IDs either. So yeah, to say I was scared was really an understatement. I'm getting over it now. I'm just grateful that the couple that I was babysitting for were close enough to make it back to me. I hate to say it, but I find the police response time to be absolutely terrible. I'm currently back in my own apartment, an hour away. I checked in once to see how the kids were doing, and they're holding up just fine. I'm glad they had proper protection in their home, and that this didn't end up being any worse than it actually was. Fifty-two-year-old female here. I was traveling by car to an out-of-town job assignment. I had stopped at a popular and busy gas station slash travel stop to fill up the car, stretch my legs, use the restroom, and of course, grab a snack. Near the end of my stop, I was approached by a developmentally disabled woman who appeared to be in her mid-twenties. She was looking for a ride to a town a couple of towns over, as her ride had abandoned her while she was in the restroom. She was more than a little upset. She didn't have a cell phone and didn't know any phone numbers so that I could call someone for her. I checked with the employees at the store and they said that she had been there for about an hour looking for a ride because she said that her friends had left her while she was using the bathroom. I then made the decision to do something that I'd never done before, offer a stranger a ride. I wasn't going to the town she wanted to go to, but I was heading in that direction, and I told her I could drop her off at the grocery store in the next town over, where I would be turning off to go to my original destination. The grocery store was always busy, and it was very likely she'd have an easier time getting a ride to where she wanted to go. Also, She'd only be about 5 miles away from where she wanted to go, instead of the 25 miles that she currently stood, and she'd have an easier time walking that distance if she absolutely had to. This was agreeable to her, and we set right off. But right away, I noticed something. I feel like there was a van following us. I tried to lose the van, but it kept pace every step of the way. Meanwhile, the woman in my passenger seat wanted to play with my phone. I told her no and that it wasn't a toy, it was for work, and then I moved it out of her reach. The van speeds up and starts to inch closer to us. The woman suddenly remembers her boyfriend's phone number and says that we need to call him right away. I can't use my phone while driving, this was in the mid 2000s so think before car sync or voice activated operations, and I was approaching the outskirts of the business district of the next town and there were plenty of signs that said no cell phone use while driving. I told her, we're almost to the grocery store, 
We can call him when we get there. She becomes agitated and yells, No, you have to take me home. I say, I told you that I couldn't do that. I'm not going there. It's in the opposite direction of where I need to go, and I'm expected soon. We'll call him from the parking lot. She becomes more upset and visibly frustrated. All the while, the van is getting closer and closer. I pull into the grocery store parking lot. It's about 4 p.m. The store is adequately busy. I pull up in front of the store and ask for her boyfriend's number, but she can't remember it now. Even worse, she won't get out of my car. She's arguing with me, and the van begins to pull into the parking lot. There's a sheriff's deputy parked nearby, and I roll down my window and signal that I need to speak with him. He walks over and asks me what's going on. I tell him where I met the young woman and how she won't get out of my car, and under my breath, I tell him that I believe the van that is pulled in was following us the entire way here. The deputy tells the woman, she brought you where you asked her to. It's time for you to leave her car now. She slowly gets out of the car, and I ask once more for her boyfriend's number, and she says, you're crazy. I don't even have a boyfriend. Oh look, there are my friends now. And she points at that damn van. The deputy and I share a quizzical look, and he says, give me your contact info. I can delay them for about 20 minutes while I check their license and registration and lecture them about abandoning a special needs adult. You get out of here, and I'll check on you before my shift is over. And one more thing, don't pick up any more hitchhikers. I left and went on to my destination. He called me as promised to make sure that I got where I was going, and told me that they were keeping an eye on this van and its owner. He told me he also contacted a colleague at the sheriff's department in the county where I was working, and that she would contact me in a day or two. While I was on assignment there, I spoke to two deputies and a detective about the woman in the van. No one ever told me anything about them, but they were very interested. My nightmare is one day I'll turn on a true crime show and see a report about this woman and her gang robbing or killing somebody. So, woman looking for a ride at the travel stop? I pray we don't ever meet again. My husband Jim and I own an antique business in a big old bizarre barn of a building. Five floors, multiple other tenants, including a restaurant. Halloween fell on a Monday last year. We locked up the business at 5 p.m. and we went to an early dinner across town. We got a call from our security monitoring company at around 6.30, a motion detect on the lower level, then another. We left dinner in a hurry but figured it was probably a bird or a rat. We don't have rats at the building, but you know, something like that. Maybe a cat. It's way too early for a break-in, after all. When we landed, I went inside the main level, upstairs and disarmed the alarm, and began fumbling noisily with the keys and the big iron gate, one of many that separate the floors at night. Jim checked the perimeter outside for signs of a break-in, but nothing doors and windows all intact. No signs of a disturbance at all. Dusk had long gone at this point. The shadows had settled in and taken over. Just wardrobes loomed in the dark. Wardrobes and nothing more, right? I headed down below to the location of the alarm, trusting Jim would follow. I'm rather accustomed to the building after dark, so I just turned on my phone light, not the overheads, and walked around boldly like I owned the place. I looked in the corner with the motion detector. Nothing. Just its red eye blinking mindlessly back at me. No rats, no cats, no birds yet. I turned and went the other way while Jim poked around a few aisles over. And that's when my eyes found it. Something laying conspicuously on the ground. Something that we had not left there. It was a fucking burglary kit. Sitting right in the middle of the floor. Bolt cutters. Metal clamps a fire extinguisher, just sitting there, waiting. I have never had a bigger case of sheer terror set down over me so fast. After all, there was no broken window or door, so whoever it was that this kit belonged to, he was still there, in the dark, with me. 
I hissed, Jim, Jim, please, please. And he didn't hear me. I literally couldn't scream. Just like in those stupid goddamn dreams, my voice stuck. Just me, the spotlit burglary tools, and a hostile presence lurking in the dusty shadows, watching while I whispered for someone to save me. Finally, a thousand years, or maybe ten seconds later, Jim wondered why I had taken root in the hallway and came to see for himself. He saw what I was frozen pointing at and said, Oh, f we bolted out that front door to call 911 and wait as we abandoned the building to the burglar. An eternal five minutes later and the police finally show up. Initially, they were pretty unimpressed with our find of the bolt cutters and crowbar. Until we pulled up the security footage that revealed the actual horror. The face of my new sleep paralysis demon. So this guy, as is obvious, He's built like a lean, mean, brick shit house. He'd crouched on a landing behind a bookcase when we closed, and watched me and my staff lock up. He bided his time. Then as calm as could be, he walked out and went to the men's restroom in the hallway downstairs. That area isn't set for motion detect for a variety of reasons. He spent a while in there moving around with the door open. He constructed the mask using one of ours, and a fake flower wreath to hold it up. He looked right into the camera barefaced, and then put the mask on. He stared at the camera fixedly in his mask for a time, and then finally pulled on some gloves. He stacked a few solid body vintage suitcases in front of a tall iron gate, and hopped right over it like it was nothing. He ran down the hall, triggering that 6.30 silent alarm, and made a loop around the floor. He ran back into the hall and moved a ladder to hop back to the other side of the gate, and bizarrely, just repeated this whole thing a few times. Then he went to the basement, wormed his way over a 15-inch gap over yet another iron gate, back to the hall again, staring right back into the camera once more. Lather, rinse, repeat. He was moving fast, up and over, back and forth, upstairs and down parkour style almost. Then he got the tools out and peeled apart one of our steel lock boxes with the crowbar and stole a handful of our keys to access showcases. At about this point, he heard me fumbling with the gate and keys upstairs. He ditched the stolen keys and tools and hid, watching me while he waited in the dark. We exited to call 911 and he ran back to the basement. Now, in the basement, there is access to a dirt tunnel that circles the perimeter of the building. He broke that door open and entered. Spiders the size of dinner plates awaited him in there. He had no light. It's muddy and dank. It's, in a word, terrifying. There's a tiny exit hatch if you take multiple turns and walk the length of the tunnel. That hatch dumps you into the busy kitchen of a restaurant whereupon one would need to stroll past the line cooks, out into the restaurant proper, and then one could leave through their front door. Plastered with mud, which does leave tracks, speaking from experience. When we went to the basement, there was his clear entrance into the tunnel, but no exit tracks, no muddy footprints, nobody walking out on the restaurant cameras, and the cooks, they noticed nothing. Reviewing the footage, timing it all, Tracing his path from camera to camera and searching the building carefully took hours. By the end, all of us including the police were starting to lose our collective cool and freak out. There was no chill when even when the guys with guns were rattled. After all, where the f did the intruder go? Jim and the two officers had no choice but to walk the dirt tunnel. The cops took one look in and were like absolutely not. Jim insisted, and so they made him walk point. The group made it about halfway through the tunnel before the cops decided that they had gone far enough and turned back around. Jim got the okay from them to board up both ends of the tunnel, which he did, solidly. And thus, the story ends. The security footage was spread widely, but we got no useful leads despite the decent face shot. 
Did he indeed crawl out the hatch into the busy kitchen and stroll out past the cooks, leaving not a trace of mud behind? I suppose. We got no suspicious smells coming out of the tunnel in later weeks and months. And to be clear, if he were stuck down there in that tunnel, he'd be long gone by now. We've only unboarded that room one time in the last year, and that was to deal with a burst water pipe just a week ago. Once the cleanup work is done, Jim and I will walk to the far end of the tunnel together for some sense of closure. I've already vowed to myself, though, if he is dead down there, I'm using his skull as a Halloween display this year. This is a long one, so bear with me. Two years ago, I was working for a company as a person who measures houses. Most people haven't heard of this job. It's where you essentially have an iPad, and you go to people's homes and draw out floor plans and measure rooms for carpet, hardwood, different flooring projects. Anyone can request one. I was 25 years old at the time, one of the few females that worked this job. I was actually pretty good at it, so they gave me a lot of work and I usually hit between 10 to 14 houses a day, driving all over multiple towns. This house was my last house of the day, in the middle of nowhere, and I was exhausted. When I got there, I was incredibly annoyed because the customer wasn't home and was late for his own appointment. 10 minutes later, he pulls up right next to my car. A middle-aged man, balding, wearing a normal office job attire with a tie and everything. He seemed a bit awkward, but was apologetic nonetheless, and let me into his home. Upon entering, the house was unbelievably spotless and organized. Minimal furniture, and it smelled like cleaning supplies. This alone didn't strike me as odd at first, beyond the fact that he was a guy and he was that clean. He also had two cats lounging in the living room. He first started acting weird as I was directed to the first bedroom. He mentioned, Wow. My cats love you. They don't take to strangers like this usually. But his cats didn't move or come anywhere near me. I just nodded and smiled while I got to work scaling out the master bedroom on my iPad. He started inquiring about the electronics I was using. Do they keep track of where you are on that thing? Immediate red flag. Yeah. And my boss knows how long each job should take based on the scope of work. It's incredible technology. I lied without missing a beat. He agreed that it was amazing. Be careful. Don't touch the gun on the nightstand. It might go off, he chuckled. Talk about immediate spine chill. I looked up from my iPad and sure enough, there was a handgun right there on the nightstand. I knew instantly that I needed to behave like nothing that was happening was triggering any alarms for me. He directed me to the second bedroom and he said the exact same thing, warning me of the gun on the nightstand that indeed was right there. This was the moment I knew I was in danger. At first I thought it was just my anxiety around guns, but at this point, the tension building between us was undeniable. There were only two bedrooms on the scope of work. I hastily met up with him in the kitchen and began running down the next steps, but he interrupted me. Could you measure the basement stairs? I forgot to add them to the list, and I think I might want to carpet them in the future. My heart sank, but my stupid customer service condition brain could not figure out how to get away with saying no. He led me to the basement door, and, you guys, there is no way he was planning on doing anything with these stairs. They were plank wooden stairs, L-shaped going down leading to an unfinished basement. Unfortunately, in order to get an accurate measure, I had to walk all the way down them to the basement. Meanwhile, he stood blocking the doorway with a smile on his face, mentioning again about whether or not my boss knew where I was, to which I shortly replied yes. Once I got to the basement, I scanned the room quickly. There was not one, but seven deep freezers lining the wall. In the middle of the room was a lit low-hanging ceiling light, revealing an old television set VHS tape scattered on the floor, and an old recliner facing the TV. Behind the set, two white shelves full of VHS tapes. In this moment, I knew one of two things was going to happen. 
He was either going to let me go, or he was going to push me down the f***ing stairs. I held my breath, put a smile on my face in an attempt to act my way out of the situation, and began to climb the stairs back up. All I could hear was my heartbeat in my ears. He was still blocking the door. No smile this time. As I got about five steps from the top, I felt him hesitate, which made me hesitate as well. You could cut the tension with a knife, and I finally understood that expression. To my absolute shock and relief, after about four seconds, he stepped to the side. I made a beeline towards the front door not saying a word when he stopped me again, saying, Oh, before you go, won't you give my cats a treat? They just loved you so much. He was holding a bag of cat treats. I quickly gave his cats a treat, thanked him, and practically sprinted from the house, all the way to my car. The second I got out of his driveway, I had the most intense panic attack and broke down crying. I tried to call my boss, but I was in a dead zone. The truth of the matter is that my boss would not have noticed I was missing for at least 24 hours when I didn't route my day the next workday. Yeah, the weirdo would have eventually been caught as it was my last known location, but I would have been long gone, I'm sure. I suffered PTSD over this experience. I couldn't sleep for over a week. I was petrified to work my job, but had no choice. I'd be hard pressed to tell you that this day doesn't still haunt me. The worst part, I was so f***ed up, jumbled, and in denial over the experience, I forgot to even write down his address. Once I finally did get a hold of my boss, she mostly laughed off the situation as him being some creep. Nonetheless, she did tell me she would flag him so that I specifically would not be resent out to measure his house if there was a need for a remeasure. At the time, I felt like that was all there was to be done. A couple months later though, I did try to find the information because I started feeling like maybe I should inform the police, but no matter who I called, since I was not exactly sure of the day I was out there, I couldn't get the info. Additionally, I was working 40 hours a week, hitting 10 to 14 houses a day. No way I could look in my ways history to find the address after a couple of months. For what it's worth, once I was out of the dead zone, I also called my boyfriend and immediately went to his house for comfort. He witnessed the immediate aftermath. All my friends have learned of this experience, and I was encouraged to share it with as many people as possible. So I thank you for listening to my story. This happened when I lived and worked in Virginia. And to this day, the only reason I can think that he didn't try to kill me was because I lied and told him my boss knew my exact location, when truthfully, she wouldn't have noticed that I was gone for at least a day. Listen to your gut. Be safe, and be sure to write down the addresses of any creepy customers you come across. You never know if you might need them. I was scrolling through old posts, and one reminded me of this story that happened about a decade ago. At the time, my kids and I lived in a little house on the corner of my street. Occasionally, I'd see a drifter wandering in the area. He wasn't bothering anyone and the house was at a very busy thoroughfare, so I never quite thought much of it. He seemed to be minding his business, so I minded my own. One day, while I was hanging out on my front porch with the kiddos, five and one at the time, he came up to the edge of my walkway, but didn't actually set foot on my property, asking if I had some food or water. It was summertime in Florida, and I'm not heartless, so I told him to wait there and give me a minute. I take the kids inside with me, grab a few bottles of water, make a few sandwiches, and throw some single-serving snacks in a bag for him. I go back outside with the kids, give it to him. He thanks me graciously before walking off and leaving. Every week or so, he'd come by, and I, or my babysitter if I was at work, would give him some water bottles and a little bit of food. He was always polite, always said thank you, and immediately moved it along. After about a month of this, I let a friend who was down on his luck stay with me since I had the extra space short term. The friend that I'm talking about is about 6 feet tall and maybe 250 pounds. Well, I got home from work one evening and my friend was sitting on my porch waiting for me and he looked absolutely agitated. 
Apparently, the drifter had been by again, but this time, he'd taken up the courage to walk all the way onto my property, up the stairs, and knock on my door. This was a stark contrast from the sidewalk, front porch relationship that we'd had up until this point. Upon the front door swinging open, it was rather obvious that the drifter was surprised to see my large friend answer the door, and not me. He immediately said something along the lines of, I thought it was just her and the kids living here, and started to act all antsy. About this point, my confused friend looked down and happened to see that the man was holding something in his right hand. You could only see the tip of it, but it very much looked like a knife. Wham! He shoved the dude off my porch and told him that if he ever saw him again within three blocks of this house, he'd break both of his arms. Once the drifter had regained his balance and his wits, he quickly sidled off down the road until my friend could no longer see him in the distance. My kid's father, we were splitsies at the time and living separately, was livid when I told him what had happened. He worked for a security systems company and immediately set an appointment up to have a security system installed in my house after that. He even paid the monthly fee himself. He also absolutely hated this particular friend of mine who was staying with us, but thanked him profusely for looking out for me and the kids. All in all, I was upset and scared, but also sad. I helped keep that man fed for over a month at that point, and it seems like I had a very interesting thanks coming my way if it were me behind that door that day. Never did see that man again after that though, fortunately enough. America Online was a big thing when I was about 13, or in other words for my generation, AIM, which stood for, you guessed it, AOL Instant Messenger. It was around 2002, and I would have been freshly 13 at that point, and in the 8th grade. I had many times gone into chat rooms by myself or with friends while goofing around. Unfortunately, unsolicited photos were a thing then too, but usually you could stay clear of that, by the chat room that you decided to enter. I didn't have any photos of myself, and this was back when you had to take a digital photo and upload it from your camera. Plus, I was 13 and self-conscious, which I'm sure anyone can relate with. But one day, a guy popped up on my screen, wanting to chat. It went fine at first. I was very naive back then, and we quickly fell into a pattern of talking. His name was Dave, and he lived in California. Eventually, our near daily interactions led to him sharing a lot about his life, what goes on in his mind, and that apparently he loved me. But the problem was, he was 19. This of course went with pressing me for pictures of myself. Now, I wasn't proud of this at first, but being 13, I just sent some pictures of some random girl I found on the internet and said that it was me. He said that he instantly fell for me, telling me age is just a number and how mature I was by his own approximation. Now at this point, he did not live in state, so there was never any chance of us meeting. But in time, he told me that he and his mom were moving up to a city that was about an hour and a half away from me. He began begging me to see him and go to a movie, or go to the fair, or anything. I had to break the catfishing truth and say those pictures were not of me, but of someone else. I'd be lying if I said that he wasn't furious at that. He had been looking forward to a different type of child this whole time. Dave forgave me a few days later though, saying, I still want to meet you, because I love you. All the things you would say to a young girl to get her to swoon. I think back and I'm like, wow, I was 13. So I told my best friend everything I just explained, and that I wanted her to go with me to meet him. There was this whole plan about him driving to see me, and going to the movies to finally meet this person who had conditioned me to think that he was the love of my life. Looking back at this as an adult, I believe I had been brainwashed into believing that this was actually normal. I didn't tell my mom, of course, and honestly, she didn't notice any of it was going on to begin with. So the day my friend and I were going to meet up with Dave, her mom came and picked us both up from school. She turned around and faced me when we got in the car and said something that made my stomach drop into nothingness. She said, Chrissy, you are not going to the movies. You're not going to meet that man. You're going to end up seriously hurt 
or kidnapped, and I am not going to allow that to happen. I cried and cried because I honestly thought I could handle everything and be fine. She told me she wasn't going to tell my mom, but I had to promise to never speak to that man again and never plan to meet a stranger online. He ended up showing up and was upset that I wasn't there. He went on aim flying off the handle like I hadn't seen at that age. It really scared me. While his words were frightening, what frightened me even more was thinking that I almost willingly put myself in this person's vicinity had I not been intercepted by my friend's mom. I held up my promise and I never talked to Dave again, but I easily believe I would have been kidnapped or worse that evening if my best friend's mom hadn't stepped in the way she did. My mom would have been none the wiser because I was none the wiser. Now that we're more than 20 years away from this experience, I'm still thankful that I learned that dire lesson when I did. The internet is a scary place, and it's best to stay out of chat rooms. Last year, my fiancé and my mother passed away, one right after the other. After they died, I obviously fell into a deep depression. Though I thought I was pulling off the whole, I'm fine thing, my friends could clearly see through it. A close friend almost demanded I move in with her and get out of the apartment I shared with my fiancé for 10 years. She wanted me to start fresh, and while I didn't think I was ready to move on, the idea of not living alone was appealing. Plus her apartment is in a much nicer neighborhood than the one I was currently living in, so I agreed. Living with her has been fantastic. Our schedules are opposite, me on days, her on nights, so we both get alone time but we also have at least one day a week off together so we get to hang out. Moving has also allowed me to be able to walk to work as it's so close. I thought that would be a godsend until my 10 minute walk caused a two month long nightmare. I decided to sit in the park that's between my apartment and my job one evening after work. As I'm sitting there, a man approached me. I saw his face first. He was almost handsome, if not a little rough looking. Even though I live in an urban area with a high homeless population, it didn't occur to me that this man was anything but a mildly handsome 40 something year old guy. So I smiled and looked back down at my phone, expecting him to just walk on by. Nope. He asked me what time it was. When I looked up to tell him, I noticed all the stuff he was carrying. It was so random. A kid's chalkboard with nonsense all over it, a paper bag full of old magazines and paperwork and a steel shelf that at one point would have held CDs. I then noticed he wasn't wearing shoes, and his hands were filthy. Needless to say, it finally dawned on me that this was not going to be a normal encounter. He started talking nonstop, some of it nonsense, but some coherent. All of it was crazy, though. Of the parts I could follow, he told me he had just been released from prison, and he was looking for a tattoo shop because he wanted to get the DOC, Department of Corrections, and the number 34, the number of DOC infractions he had while locked up, tattooed on him, and he wanted the DOC to pay for it. He then noticed a button I had on my bag that had the logo for a local gay bar on it. He told me he had gone there one night and went home with a guy. Then he looked me up and down and said, but young ladies are my problem. At this point, I decided it best to gather my stuff and leave immediately. Now, I love this apartment, but it has its drawbacks, which became glaringly obvious after this encounter. The apartment is on the first floor. I love it because you can walk out the sliding glass doors, one in the living room and one in my bedroom, right onto an awesome gated patio that has tables and grills for barbecuing, so it's awesome in the summer. I now hate it because it's right on the street level and the fencing is clearly very easy to scale. One very early morning, around 4.30 a.m., I hear a man scream, What the f*** are you doing? So loud and so close it woke me up from a dead sleep, and I legitimately thought it was coming from inside my bedroom. As it turned out, it was coming from outside. A neighbor had been leaving for work and discovered a man, that same man from the park, sleeping against my sliding glass door. The dude got scared and ran off. 
my neighbor checked up on me, and once I calmed down, I chalked it up to a f***ed up coincidence. Two weeks later, though, I was sleeping, and at some point, this man came onto the patio and was now tapping on my sliding glass door. I laid there, frozen in fear, until he escalated to full-blown kicking the glass. I turned the light on to grab my phone, and that's when he took off. I called the police, and they came over to take the report and to look at the footage from the cameras inside the building. The footage confirmed it was the man from the park. And more disturbingly, the footage from the hallway camera showed that on more than one occasion, he had slipped in the building behind a resident and sat in the lobby for several hours. At one point, going down the hallway and trying my doorknob, in addition to the neighbor's doorknob to see if they were locked. He even went so far as to hide in the little mailbox room when he saw my roommate coming in from work. The police think he either followed me from the park or had just happened to notice me at one point when I was on the patio. It's been a few weeks now and I haven't seen him and no one has reported seeing him in or around the building. My roommate bought me a canister of pepper spray and my kind of kooky, albeit very well-meaning neighbor has made it very clear that he's retired military and a bit of a gun nut and he checks up on me nightly. So I'm not as freaked out as I could be, but still, crazy guy from the park, let's make it a point to not meet ever again. So this happened about seven months ago. I was visiting San Diego for job interviews and staying at my favorite hotel in Sorrento Mesa. For a background, I'm a 40 year old man and a pretty big guy. To put it into terms, I'm over six feet tall and a former club bouncer. Now, on to the weirdness. On my third night at the hotel, I was up pretty late after hanging out with some old friends after my interviews. I got back to the hotel around 2 a.m. with some sunny donuts. After eating a few, drinking a few more, and watching some South Park, I decided to have a smoke before heading to bed. This made it now around 3 a.m. I head downstairs and walk out front to the smoking area by the fountain but there's another couple who are also staying at the hotel already there. I didn't want to impose on them, so I decided to just walk around the outside parts of the hotel while I smoked. I walked around the pool, the barbecue area, the basketball courts, and then started back for the side door. But as I start back towards my hotel room, a black sedan drove up alongside me and stopped. The window rolled down, and this tiny Asian woman asked if I knew how to get out of the parking lot and back to the street. Now, from where we were when she asked me, we were no more than 150 feet from the street in a straight line right in front of her. So I thought she was drunk or maybe just blind. So I politely said, yeah, just keep going straight, turn left at the tree. She then asked me if I could get in the car and show her. Now, again, I'm a big bearded guy and this woman was tiny. She looked very much like a Walmart Ali Wong. There was absolutely no intimidation factor, but for some reason, I instantly felt uneasy. The street was literally right in front of her. She could see the road, I was sure of it. Also, the windows were all tinted far more than what they should have been, and I honestly couldn't tell if someone else might have been in the car with her. I used the smoking as an excuse to not get in the car, but she said she didn't mind and gave me this very creepy smile. I politely declined, and again pointed out that the road was right there, so I'd just be walking back in five seconds anyway. She asked again if I would get in and show her. This was feeling like a weird kid, creepy ice cream truck situation. I mean, guys, how often do decently good looking women just drive up and ask you to get in their car at 3 a.m. in a hotel parking lot? How often does anyone ask a big bearded guy to just hop on in the car under these circumstances? Nothing about this felt right. So again, I politely declined as I finished my smoke and was luckily already standing right at the hotel side door when all this began. So I just headed back in. The woman then drove off as she rolled up the window, right exactly to the exit she had just asked me to show her. So I told the front desk about this and they said they'd keep an eye out, but I'm pretty sure that nothing was ever done or came of this. 
It was just one of those things that really makes me wonder. What the hell did she want me in the car so badly for? A pretty man? I am not. So it had to be some kind of scam. Or worse. I just wonder exactly how much danger I was in that night. I'm a woman in my 30s who lives alone in a small house at the head of a quiet cul-de-sac in the UK. The street is a maze of roads away from the main road, which means that other than delivery guys and the occasional salesperson, you very rarely see anyone that you don't recognize. I don't exactly know all of my neighbors, but I know what they look like, and I know where they live. I can recognize their cars, things like that. This weirdness happened over the space of a few months several years back. I work from home so I'm usually in, and sometimes I don't have a lot to do. The first day was one of those lazy days. It was about 4pm. Someone knocked on the door. I have a surveillance camera hidden in the wooden canopy above the front door. So I checked to see who it was because I wasn't expecting any deliveries, and I couldn't be bothered to deal with a salesperson right then. It was a woman who looked to be in her late 40s, maybe early 50s. She was very smartly dressed, like really expensive clothes and jewelry, stuff I could never afford. Most people around here generally couldn't afford it either, so it stood out. She looked flustered and borderline agitated, glancing towards the back garden before trying to look through the tiny, frosted glass window on the front door. I noticed she was carrying a dog's leash, but I didn't see a dog. As it happens, at the far side of my back garden, there are two hedges. There's a hedge that I own within my property boundaries, and there's a second hedge outside my boundary that's council-owned, along a small grassland where people walk dogs. I know for a fact there is a hole in the council-owned hedge, which I've reported to the council several times over the past decade, but they've done pretty much nothing but load up a little bit of sod around the roots. Because of my hedge, I can't reach it to do anything about it myself. Consequently, when I saw the dog's leash, I thought, shit, I bet her dog has gone through the hole. If it's a big dog, it's not getting into my garden, but if it's a small dog, it might be able to work its way through, and I've always got some cooked meat, so I figured I might be able to lure it out. I'm a dog lover, so of course I wanted to help this woman if I could. I open the door, and this woman gives me the weirdest look. Like, she was expecting someone completely different to answer the door, and that I shouldn't be there. To be fair to her, my mom used to live here too, so I didn't think much of the weird look to begin with. Maybe she was expecting my mom to open up. I say hello, and she just stares at me for the longest 30 seconds of my life, before she tries to look past me and asks to see Margaret. I don't know what it is about other people's mistakes, but whenever someone has the wrong number, I always end up apologizing, as if it's some fault of my own. So that's what I did. I apologized and told her there was no Margaret at this address. But again, she gives me that look. Only this time, there's anger building behind it. Uh, yes there is, she insists. It occurs to me at this point that I have a relative called Margaret, but she lives about 60 miles away and I haven't seen her in years. Nonetheless, just in case she's got her addresses muddled, I ask, are you looking for Margaret? And say her last name. But she just hisses at me. You know exactly who I'm looking for. What have you done with her? Now I'm absolutely lost at this point. I've lived here for 20 years, and I know the name of the previous owner, so I know she's not asking for them. I also know the names of my neighbors, and the names of the people who have lived on the street in the time that I've been around, and since moved and none of them were named Margaret. So all I can do is tell her she's got the wrong address. She refutes this by saying no, this is, then listing my address, and saying that I'm lying. Now that was a tad alarming. She's at the right address. However, she clearly thinks I've done something to somebody who to the best of my knowledge has never lived here. Now, I don't know how long the previous owner had this house, but we must be talking about at least 30 years since anyone called Margaret might have lived here. It's at this point that I notice she subtly wrapped the dog leash around her now clenched fist, like she's planning to use it as a weapon. In my youth, I did plenty of self-defense training, so I'm not exactly scared of her, 
but I'm obviously getting a bit concerned about the situation that's brewing. I don't particularly wish to get involved in a brawl on my doorstep with a complete stranger. I'm torn between shutting the door in her face and trying to de-escalate the situation. In the end, I close the door a little so she's got less to aim at and tell her, look, I don't know who you're looking for, but if you think something's happened to your friend, maybe we should just call the police and let them sort it out. Sure enough, the woman slams her fist with the leash wrapped around it into my door. I later discovered she'd struck the door hard enough to crack the frosted glass window in the middle. She's bleeding from doing it, so it must have hurt. But she doesn't flinch or show any sign of pain. What the hell? Any confidence I had in my self-defense classes started to waver here because I'm not used to people who don't feel pain. All I can think now is that she's on something and having a really bad trip. So this is when I put on my scariest voice and tell her to get the fuck back. I let her know I'm calling the police and if she's still here when they get here, she can deal with them because I'm not dealing with her anymore. She tries to stop me from closing the door, but I shove her back and manage to get it closed and locked. I make a point to stand next to the door while I'm calling 999 so she can hear me. While I'm waiting for the police to turn up, I watch her on the surveillance feed. She moves out of the shot a couple of times, presumably to check the back of the house, and I hear her calling out for Margaret. A few minutes before the police finally turn up, I see her kick over my trash bins in a rage. But that's when the most chilling thing happens. She walks back to the front door and stares directly into my camera. That camera is pretty well hidden. I'm not saying that nobody could spot it, but most people would only know it was there if they'd been looking for it. And most people aren't looking for cameras, right? But she knew it was there. She must have eyeballed it previously. When? I don't know. I later reviewed all of the footage I had from that day, and she never made eye contact with it once. She never even looked in that direction. I only had about a week's worth of footage before the oldest footage is overwritten, and I checked everything, and she was only on camera that one day. All I can think is she'd been here more than a week prior. While she's staring right into it, she flips me the finger and then makes a throat-cutting gesture before just strolling off. I head to the window to watch her leave, and she's walking like she doesn't have a care in this world. She doesn't look back, just wanders off. Police finally show up. Good job I wasn't being murdered. They take a statement. I give them a copy of their surveillance footage, and that's that. I called a couple of times to follow up, but they had nothing. Nobody ever called me about it. I won't lie, this unsettled me for a few weeks. I moved the knife block closer to the door, though out of sight of any of the windows. I started staying up really late and not getting much sleep, which didn't really help the situation. On some nights, I was so tired that I started experiencing auditory hallucinations. I'd hear people who weren't there talking, and because this woman was the cause of all my stress, I heard her voice and the name Margaret most of all. Every time I heard the gate open, it put me on edge. I'd review the surveillance footage every single day. Eventually, as the weeks passed and I hadn't heard anything else, I started to regain some of my comfort and just put it down to a weird experience. But it didn't last. About four, maybe five weeks after the first encounter, she came back. It was just after midnight this time. I was in the living room, mucking about on my phone with the TV on low volume for some background noise. I heard a car door slam, and I peeked out the front window. The dark colored car was parked at the end of my driveway. I couldn't see what make or model it was, but it looked like some sort of a state car. I think Americans call them station wagons, right? I didn't see anyone moving about, but a minute or two later, the front gate swung open with its metallic groaning, and there was a knock on the door. Even when I'm not involved in a blood feud over imaginary Margaret's, I'm not going to answer the door at that time. I check the surveillance camera. Its night vision mode is pretty shitty, but I'm positive it's that woman again. I can even see what I think is the dog's leash again. And of course, she knows I'm watching her because she looks right at the camera again. And I tell you, when someone is already giving you the heebie-jeebies, the way night vision makes people's eyes look like soulless black voids, 
doesn't do much to make you feel better. Suddenly, she shouts out, Shut that f***ing racket off and come out here now. I had the TV on, but as I mentioned, it was on low volume. There was no way she could hear it from outside the front door. I couldn't even hear it if I walked into the hallway. I'm convinced at this point she's mentally unwell. So I call the police again. I want them to stay on the line, but they just tell me that someone will be over soon and to call them back immediately if things escalate. So I'm waiting, watching, and just hoping she doesn't start to try to smash the window or something. She kicks over my trash bins again, don't know what she's got against them, and yells something else out which I couldn't quite make out, but whatever it was, it was enough for one of the neighbors to come and investigate themselves. I watch the neighbor talking with her for a minute. She's demonstratively saying something, wagging her finger towards my front door, but my neighbor is eventually able to get her to leave. He even sticks around for a bit to make sure she's gone. Sadly, that also means she had left before the police turned up again and made me feel like I was a bother to them. Another statement, handing over more security footage, more nothing. I caught up with a neighbor the next day and he apologized because it didn't occur to him to make a note of the registration plate, but he told me that she'd said much the same thing as she'd said to me previously, that she wanted to know where Margaret was and what I'd done with her. I'm grasping for answers at this point, even if she's mentally unwell, the fact that she's sticking to this Margaret story and has the right address makes me think there's something more to this than somebody having a breakdown. Then it clicks. Is Margaret her dog? Does she think that I've stolen her pet? Did she have a dog go through the hole in the back? Does she think that I've hurt her dog? Is that what this is all about? It'd be another few weeks before she came back. This time, 3 a.m., I'm awakened by knocking at the door. A few minutes later, I hear tapping on the bedroom window, and I know it's her. I can hear her saying things, but I can't really make them out because they're too muffled through the windows. It's like she didn't want to get the neighbor out again, so she's trying to keep it quiet. I jump out of bed and put some clothes on as quickly as I can. I try and follow her as best as I can as she moves around the outside of the house, from room to room knocking, tapping, and muttering. I think I hear a few coherent words like noise, racket, and I'm pretty sure she called me a bitch, but maybe I was imagining that part. I can't check the surveillance footage this time because she spray painted the damn lens. Not that it'd matter much this time. She's not lingering by the front door. I'm thinking about calling the police again, but it's proven to be a waste the first two times. And I get the feeling that if I called them out a third time and she's gone, that they're just going to start accusing me of wasting their time, even if I do have the evidence. They've not exactly been that helpful so far. In the end, I wait by the front door and just listen. Eventually, she knocks again. And this is when I call out, is Margaret your dog? Dead silence, nothing. I can't see anything through the frosted glass because it's too dark. I have no idea where she is, and I don't want to turn the outside lights on. I don't even know why. She knows I'm in the house because I've called out to her, but I still don't want to draw any more attention to myself. I end up standing there for who knows how long, maybe an hour, probably more because the sun began coming up. My heart is going a mile a minute, pretty much the entire time. Once it's bright enough, I start checking through the windows to see if I can see her. Nope, nothing. I tentatively open the front door and look outside. Still can't see her. I grab something to arm myself with, just in case. Can't remember what now, but check all around my house, including the back garden, and she's nowhere to be seen. As I'm heading back to the front door, I spot the oddest thing. The gate is closed. The gate is physically attached to the side of my house, and when it opens and closes, it makes a fair bit of noise. You'd definitely hear it if someone opened or closed it when you were standing next to the front door. But like I said, it's closed. So what does that mean? Did she jump it somehow? It's possible, I guess, but I wouldn't want to try it. Anyway, I open the gate and head out to the end of the driveway. I look around and there's not a sign of anyone. I turn back to the house and see the word liar spray-painted in big, bold print on the front of my house. 
and that dog leash that she was carrying left on the floor beneath it. That was thankfully the last time I ever heard from or saw this woman, but part of me still thinks that she comes by sometimes. Ever since this all happened, I get these creeped out feelings occasionally at night and it compels me to check out the window. I don't know whether I'm imagining it or what, but now and again, I swear I see that same dark colored estate car out on the street. Not parked at the end of my driveway these days, but I just can't shake the feeling that she's in there, just watching my house. Perhaps she was looking for her dog, and she keeps thinking that she'll see me with it. I don't know. I don't want to know. But lady, leave me alone. I was about 12 when this happened. Me and my mom had gone to a town 45 minutes out to do some shopping with some of her friends. I had a corn snake at home at the time, so I asked her if I could walk around to the pet store one door down from the mini supermarket we were at to compare the prices of frozen mice with our local seller. She said sure, and just to come back as soon as I was done. The pet store had been there as long as I could remember. It had a very warehouse sort of feel about it and it was poorly lit by dim fluorescent lights that were too far above the floor. Before checking out the mice, I just wanted to check out the rest of the store, being the curious 12-year-old that I was. As I was roaming the aisles, I noticed this man. He was in every aisle that I strolled down. Bald, middle-aged, a bit tubby, wearing dark blue plumber's overalls and a dirty white shirt. It was summer and it was hot, and I remember wondering why on earth anyone would come into a non-air conditioned building wearing overalls. This man carried a basket, but there was nothing in it. And as he slowly stalked me down each aisle, I noticed that his basket wasn't getting any more full. This is when I knew that something was up. I started walking faster, taking random turns down different aisles to see if I was just being paranoid. But there he was always about 10 to 15 feet behind me. At some point, I thought I finally had lost him. That's when I power walked out of the pet store, and as soon as I cleared the doors, I sprinted down the street back to the supermarket my mom was in. She hadn't even made it down the second aisle completely, but I caught up to her and immediately stripped off my bright pink hoodie and slung it into the cart, as well as ripped the hair tie out of my hair. I was smart for doing that, at least I felt so because when I looked back at the entrance of the supermarket, there was that same man, still carrying that same empty basket from the pet store, now scanning the grocery store for any sight of a 12-year-old girl and a bright pink hoodie and ponytail. When we left, I saw that man in his van as he drove away, a plain white van, like something out of a true crime documentary or horror film. I think about him sometimes, and how... I think that if he caught up to me before I got to that supermarket on that quiet Wednesday afternoon, what horrors could have awaited me in the back of that creepy plain van? Guy in the overalls who followed me out of the pet store without even putting down his basket. Even after 10 years, I'm glad to never meet again. Until a few days ago, I had no idea that this actually happened to me. I'm not going to talk about the indirect circumstances that triggered this to start haunting me in flashbacks, but I'll rather focus on the story itself, how I remember it, and how my cousin, who was with me when it happened, remembers it as well. For some context, my cousin and I are the same age. We are both women and currently 25 years old. She is only five days younger than me, and her family rented a floor in my parents' house when we were toddlers. So we basically did everything together, spent every day together until we turned five, when her family bought an apartment in another city some 30 miles away from where we lived. Since we had a very strong connection, almost codependent, it was very difficult for us to get used to not living together. So two years later, we made an agreement with our parents that we would each visit each other each weekend. And during the summer break, she would spend one week at our place and I would spend the other week at their place, and we basically exchanged like that until the end of summer break. This went on for years. Since we were spending all our free time together, by the time we turned 10 or 11, 
we had already exhausted all our adventure ideas in the backyard. Tree climbing, building a tree house, setting up tents, camping in the backyard, etc. And we really needed something new to do. So we decided to go fishing together every Friday on the river near my house. It's about a 20 minute walk. Now, of course we had no tools needed for a true fishing experience. We had a butterfly net that we would place in the water and on a good day, we would catch a dozen or so tiny fish with it. That was enough for our restaurant game. We would come back home, bake the fish under the sunlight, and then serve it and decorate it in plastic plates that we would later serve to our imaginary customers. We've done this for weeks and always made sure we were safe while doing it. And that wasn't very difficult since it was a pretty peaceful neighborhood. We called it the Yellow Bridge. And there was usually no one else at the river at the time that we were there. But one day, it was different. Very different. How I remember it. A couple of days ago, the memory of this encounter suddenly spilled out in my mind. We were either 10 or 11 at the time, and it was Friday. She was at our place that week, so we took the butterfly net and went fishing on the river. We were alone, sitting under a large willow tree right next to the river, when suddenly, a man showed up basically from nowhere. He was standing a couple of meters away from us. He had blackish hair with specks of gray, so I'm guessing now that he was in his late 40s or early 50s. He wore a dark blue t-shirt, a little smudged on the collar. He asked us what we were doing, and we said we were fishing. He continued to walk back and forth on that part of the shore. Now, under the yellow bridge, the shore itself is at least 500 meters long. He could have gone anywhere, but he stayed where we were at. Then, he came a little closer, and that's when we stood up. He told us he was having issues with his wife, and we just nodded our heads, trying to avoid the conversation and follow the don't talk to strangers rule. We didn't ask him anything, but he took a flip phone out of his pocket and opened it in front of us. I have to show you my wife, he said. Okay, we replied. When he found what he was looking for, he stepped even closer to us and turned the phone in our direction. It was a picture of a completely naked woman sitting in a chair with her legs spread. Once again, we just nodded. He then proceeded to show us more pictures, and it was quite clear that it wasn't his wife, because the pictures weren't even of the same woman. But all of them were naked, from head to toe, with their legs spread or in other very suggestive positions. Now that I think of it, the quality of the images, the fashion, and the aesthetics could best be described as 70s style porn. It could be that he took pictures from some old magazine he had, or had them sent to him by someone. I remember I looked at my cousin and mouthed, that's not his wife, and she just nodded. Isn't she beautiful? he asked. She is, both my cousin and I were able to stammer. We then remembered that we had left our net in the river. So we went back to the willow tree and reached in the water for the net. He was standing there in the same spot as before, just looking at his phone. He then showed us a very low quality picture of two naked men and another naked woman. The picture really looked like pictures taken with a flip phone camera at the time. This is me, he said, and pointed at one of the men in the picture. Once again, all we could do was nod and said that we had to go home. He then said the words that have been haunting me for days now. You think my wife is beautiful? She thinks you're beautiful too, and she would love to meet you. Come with me to meet her, and we can play together. No, we have to go home, I replied. Oh, you little party breaker. Maybe your friend doesn't want to go home. Come on, I want to play with you, he said and turned to my cousin. No, I really want to go home, my cousin replied. This is where the details of the memories stop. What I remember next is him giving up, just not being there anymore, and us leaving, giggling and laughing as we walked away, and mocking his voice and tone on the way back home. But I found it weird that only after so many years have I remembered this situation, and I've brushed it off as a potential dream or false memory. But since his words kept echoing in my head, I had to call my cousin, and I described my memory word for word as I described it here, and she said that it did happen, just slightly different from how I remembered it. This is how my cousin recalls it. 
First off, it happened. All the details are correct. But once she told me she really wanted to go home, he was way too close, and we were scared to start running or turn our backs to him, since we thought that he could catch us. So we just stayed there for a while, and kept pretending like he was not there. We played with our catch, the tiny fish in a bucket filled with water, and talked about our fathers who work in the police. Obviously it was a lie, her father is a forest ranger, and mine works in tech, and how they were strong, so strong that they could kill a man with one punch. The man didn't believe our exaggerated story, and he kept walking in circles around us. Not too close, but he did keep an eye on us the entire time. And we waited, and waited, and waited. At one point, he went into the bushes behind us to use the restroom. At least that's what he said. This is when we got up and began running. We ran across the bridge and kept running until we got to the part of the neighborhood where there are lots of houses. When we were already near to my house, I stopped in the middle of the road. Exhaustion had started to set in, and I told my cousin that my legs wouldn't move. So she helped me get down the other side of the road, and we sat there until I felt better. Today, I know that what I experienced was not exhaustion, but a state of shock. Once I felt better, we made our way back home, threw away the fish, and decided that we were never going to go fishing again. We never told this to our parents because we knew that what happened had something to do with sex, and at the time we thought that everything related to sex is shameful and shouldn't be talked about in a family setting. My cousin said she is surprised that I thought it was a dream and that I didn't remember it until now, since I've had such an extreme reaction and she has PTSD from that event. Even today, she rarely goes anywhere alone and is absolutely terrified whenever someone mentions the Yellow Bridge. While we never found ourselves down by the bridge after that day, and even though we never saw that creepy guy again, I really wish we had the ability to tell an adult what happened back then. Showing us terrible pictures and lingering around us weirdly is one thing, but now that I've come to remember it, it hurts my heart to think what if that man pulled that same act on another little girl, and she didn't have the bright idea to run off. I hope deep deep down that that situation never played out, but part of me just doesn't know. I work in retail, and I have a very unique name. This story happened a few years ago when I first started out my job. I work at a 24-hour convenience store, and at this point I was working the graveyard shift. I'm used to all types of unsavory folks, but there was this one guy who left me particularly unsettled. It had to be about 3 a.m., and unfortunately, I was working alone because my coworker decided to call out last minute. The store was absolutely dead and I was packing out a delivery when he walked in. He was a short, stocky black man, a little older than me, probably late 20s, perhaps early 30s. I looked up from the task at hand and greeted him with a friendly customer service smile before asking him if he needed help with anything. He grinned, looked me up and down, his brown eyes darkening with lust. Yeah, do you sell condoms? I nodded and pointed him to the health and beauty section of the store and proceeded to make my way to the register to cash him out. He browses for a little while, and typically picked up a box of magnums and those herbal sexual supplement pills. So how are you tonight? He inquired. I told him I was fine, working hard, and anxious to be done with my shift to go home. His eyes traveled up and down my body once more, his eyes settling on my name tag, which is pinned just beneath my left breast. I felt a little uncomfortable at this point, I've never really been comfortable with people staring at me, and his eyes lingered longer than necessary. He asked how to pronounce my name. I tell him. He says it's nice, politely. I say thank you and begin to scan and bag his items, trying to avoid eye contact at this moment. He asks do I have a boyfriend. Truthfully, I say yes. He comments that he must be a lucky man and wishes he could be in his shoes. Again, I smile uncomfortably and as we're supposed to do, ask if he needs anything else. Not unless I can have you, he responds rather lazily. Now I'm getting annoyed. I ignore his comment and proceed to tell him his total. He swipes his card, 
I complete the transaction and tell him to have a good night. He thanks me and then asks if I'm working by myself. No, my coworker is downstairs doing some paperwork. The lie came instinctually. But at this point, he grins. No, he isn't. I've been watching you since 12, and I haven't seen another person in here all this time. Are you afraid? I frowned. Okay, he's been watching me. That's not creepy, at all. I tell him he needs to leave if he's done shopping. I have work to complete. Once again, he laughs at me, pretty much right in my face. I thought he was going to argue, but just then a group of drunken guys walk in, and he takes that opportunity to leave. Later that evening, I pull out my phone to check my Facebook and see that I have a single new friend request. Guess who it's from? Again, I have a unique name. There are only two people on Facebook that have it. I block and delete the friend request immediately. Next morning, as I'm heading to the subway station, I see there's a poster in the ticket taker booth, and it happens to catch my eye. The face on this poster was all too familiar. It was the creep from my store. The picture didn't have a name attached to it, and the quality appeared as if it were pulled off a surveillance camera. But it was the heading that really grabbed me. Wanted for sexual assault and battery at the East 96th Street Station. If seen, please report to the transit police immediately. I see that the incident happened more than a month ago. I make it to work and hurriedly tell my manager, who called the police and gave them our tip. I don't know if this man was ever caught, but please, let's not meet outside my store or inside my store for that matter. And to this day, I think I can trace my uncomfortability with wearing name tags back to this singular experience. Thanks for that, too. First off, this story happened almost 15 years ago now. I'll jump right in because it's a long one. I got home from work one day and logged into Facebook to find a message from someone that I didn't know. It was too long ago to remember verbatim what was said, but it was along the lines of, Hey, I know you have no idea who I am, but I've been trying to decide what to do for a few days now and figured I had to let you know what's been going on. Someone has been catfishing me using your identity for over two years, and I just found out about it last week. The sender of the email was clearly pretty shaken up, and understandably so. They were experiencing a lot of emotions. According to her, she had met the imposter online a little over two years prior to her writing this, and they had been engaged in a pretty intimate long-distance relationship for a majority of that time. The imposter had created a Facebook and had over time reposted almost all of my photos with their own captions to them, including a good amount of art I'd drawn that they had taken credit for. They created fake profiles for a good amount of my friends and close family as well, so they could comment on the photos of themselves to make the profile seem legit. The funniest part to me is that although most things in my real life seem to be mirrored in this fake profile, I, straight male, was instead portrayed as trans. I think the main reason for this was that the sender of the email and the imposter would actually speak on the phone. An imposter turned out to be female in the end, and therefore needed a reason to justify her more feminine sounding voice. The sender of the email was justifiably both angry and creeped out, and wanted to find the catfish. She started asking me a lot of questions about my life, but phrasing them like, is your sister's name blank? And did you go to blank high school? Some of the questions were clearly information that anyone could glean from a quick browse of my profile. But then she asked, is your best friend blank? Which struck me as odd since despite this person actually being my closest friend and who I spend the most time with, we barely have any Facebook photos together and most are from a long time ago. Then she asked, were you adopted and are your half siblings named blank and blank? which sealed the deal for me since I knew for a fact I'd never posted about being adopted online. The sender of the email already had an idea that this person had known me in real life, but this confirmed it for me. The sender of the email had contacted me shortly after confronting the imposter for the first time. I guess after two years, they'd finally become suspicious of the fact that the imposter wouldn't show their face. 
I have no idea how it took this long for them to figure out that they were being played. But I'm glad they finally decided to give the ultimatum of show your face or I'm cutting you off. I'm pretty sure this is the point where the imposter admitted to being a catfish and that she'd been using the identity of someone she had a crush on in high school before hanging up the phone. I was given the URL so I could look through the profile myself, which was up for about two days after I saw it before it was all removed. It was definitely really bizarre. The imposter had posted more than I ever had on Facebook, and it genuinely seemed like they'd lived a pretty involved double life online as me. Almost everyone I'd posted photos with on my real profile would then have their own fake profiles created that had enough content to be genuinely convincing so they could be tagged in and validate these new photos. Some of these profiles seemed to have gone and made their own real friends as well. And I wondered if any of those were used to facilitate even more online dating deception. Either way, the amount of time that this person had spent fabricating their alter ego's online presence was pretty shocking. The whole time I'd been crawling down this Facebook rabbit hole, the sender of the email was looking through my real profile. After a while, she sent me a message saying, did you take these photographs? And showed me what I remember as a black and white photo of a barn or something. I hadn't taken that picture, which was weird since everything else on the fake profile originated with me and she'd noticed the discrepancy. We both tried reverse image searching with no luck. Then either through a stroke of genius or somewhat suspiciously, I really couldn't tell. She thought to flip the fake number the imposter had written into the fake FB profile around in reverse. And a Google search came up with a landline that belonged to the home address of a girl that I'd gone to high school with. Real me was Facebook friends with real imposter's profile. So we both went snooping around and found the photo that she'd claimed I'd taken, which pretty much confirmed to me that this was the imposter. I'm pretty sure there were more indicators to the sender as well, but I can't remember. I thought about messaging her for a while, but decided that it probably wouldn't lead to anything good. At the time, my thoughts were definitely, let's not meet. I talked a few times with the sender of the email just to try and decompress a bit. But honestly, I just wanted to distance myself from the situation. And I also had my suspicions about the sender as well. I figured maybe it was imposter's one last ditch effort to try to talk to me. Although when it was all over, the sender seemed to be eager to leave this all behind as well, so maybe not. Either way, it was a really strange experience. I felt mostly freaked out and violated, but I guess there was a small part of me that was flattered by it. There were a lot of mixed emotions. The weirdest part to me is that I'm a really approachable person and would have definitely been willing to talk and probably be friends if this person had just approached me instead. Although I'm still not sure if this was done out of an obsession for me or if this person felt like I was just a suitable image to base this fabricated persona off of. I remember talking to her probably twice throughout high school and really didn't have a very good idea of who she was other than a quiet hipster girl. If either person involved hears this, I'd definitely be happy to talk now. It's been years, but I've gone from being very put off to always wondering why this person chose me over a myriad of other more attractive or interesting people online to base their other life off of. According to the sender who contacted me, she'd probably spent more time online pretending to be me than she actually did going about her own life. I have a tumultuous history of addiction and I've had plenty of my own escapes, which is why it's always fascinated me that someone would want to pretend to live someone else's life as a means of doing that. Because at the end of the day, the person pretending to be me had no idea that I spent my time daydreaming of being a different person as well. I guess it just goes to show that no matter how much you wish you were someone else, chances are that person has plenty of their own reasons to want to escape their own demons. Thanks for listening. I feel better after just getting this off my chest. So this happened when I was 14. I'm 29 at the time of writing this. I remember this story from time to time, meaning like once or twice every few years. And it never fails to put me in a weird mood for some reason. I was walking with one of my friends in the city the other day, and a group of kids skateboard past us. Lo and behold, that was the thing that sparked this memory. I figured I'd write it down 
and then share it with you all. I'm not going to use this kid's real name, so I'll just call him Vinny. I come from a town where the people you went to school with in kindergarten were the same kids you graduated with. Vinny moved to our school about halfway through the year. When new kids came to our school, everybody flocked to them. At 14, I was admittedly kind of a dork, but also somewhat of a douche, which made me surprisingly likable to most people. Vinny would always sit by himself during lunch, minding his business, not messing with anybody. But something that I found amusing about him was that he would get absolutely infuriated if people asked him if he skated. I took that as a challenge to try and piss him off, and you know it worked. The first time he and I had class together, I remember the teacher asking him if he had his books yet. He responded with, my wife never confirmed my school schedule with the front office. I remember everybody thought that it was funny. You're 14 years old and you have a wife? He was clearly trying to get one over on the teacher. My friends and I were skating after school that day and we saw Vinny. I remember talking to my friends about what he said and we all became oddly infatuated with the kid. It took some doing, but after about a week of letting him hang out with us, he became one of the boys. One of my buddies asked if we could go sleep at his house on Friday night, knowing that that's just what we did at that age. We took turns staying at each other's houses to skate, play video games, and smoke the green stuff. Vinny looked perturbed, which is something I wish mattered to me back then, but the next day at school, he said that it was okay after asking his parents. My buddies and I rode our bikes to where he lived, with clothes for the night and our skateboards strapped to our bags. We met his family, who at face value seemed completely okay. But then, things got a little weird. First off, his dad had a huge weapons collection. At the time, I thought it was awesome. He even took us out into a field by a canal to shoot some of his assault rifles. I know now that that wasn't cool of him, especially without our parents' consent. But next, we met Vinny's wife. Yeah, the girl was real. She was also 26. While we lived in the southern US, even there this was taboo. They would hold hands and stuff, and at the time, we all thought it was dope. It was like dating a senior when you're a freshman, only he was in high school and she paid taxes. Things kind of got to a new level of weird when Vinny's dad had his arm around Vinny's mom and his other arm around a girl that couldn't have been terribly older than we were at the time. Apparently, that was also his wife. We then spent about two hours praying with the family in the living room. I was raised Catholic, but couldn't determine which religion they were practicing. Once we finished with prayer, we went outside to start skateboarding. After a few minutes, his dad came outside in a huff and ordered us back into the house. Vinny's mother then had us stand in line outside of the bathroom to take a bath. It still skeeves me out, but I remember we weren't allowed to drain the water from the tub, and I was the last one to bathe. Also, all of the mirrors in the house were covered with sheets. I don't know the significance of this, but it just makes more sense to me to not even have mirrors at that point. We were told to go to bed, even though the sun wasn't even down yet. Vinny went to bed with his wife. The three of us that remained just laid there in one single queen-sized bed and talked about how much fun we weren't having. The final straw for the night was having to hear Vinny's parents, and maybe the other woman, doing the dirty in the next room over. It was nearly 11 p.m. when we decided to just get on our bikes and leave. It was dark and we had to ride through some bad neighborhoods, but we made it safely to my buddy's house. Vinny's mother would eventually call our parents later and leave some cryptic messages, something that implied that there had been some trouble. Vinny was pulled from school about a week later and we just never saw him again. I don't know what that family was into, maybe he wasn't creepy at all and I just didn't understand. All I know is that we felt massively uncomfortable. I have no issues with religion, but if this was part of their practice, I do think it's a little weird. Out of curiosity, I went to find Vinny on Facebook, and all I can confirm is that he, his mother, father, and one of his sisters had died. There were no public records of what happened to them, or if they even died at the same time. I'll admit, this is probably not the creepiest story out there, but it's one that I still come back to. It's worth the tell, 
and it's for sure an interesting memory at the very least. To set the stage for this story, we must go back to the far-off year of 1988. The location is the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. I was 10 years old, and with me was my mom, dad, best friend, and our golden retriever, Amber. We were very much an outdoor family, and had many camping trips before this and since. But to this day, when I think about it, I still remember the terror I felt that weekend so long ago. After a brief talk with my father recently, it kind of came back to the front of my mind. He was also able to fill in a few details that I had forgotten. This holiday was like many others. We packed up the station wagon with everything we would need for a hike into one of our favorite lakes to camp at. To make this trip even more exciting for me was the fact that it was my birthday weekend and I got to pick this lake. After we arrived at the trailhead and got our packs on, my dad got his sidearm out and strapped it onto his belt. In Oregon, open carry was permitted in national forests, and my dad always had a gun on his hip while in the woods, which always added a sense of security. We had a close call with a bear one time in which it came in handy. The lake is about a four mile moderate hike through some thick forest, but the trail itself was well maintained and was never very busy, so it was going to be a very pleasant hike in. We started off on our hike, and back in the 80s, it was not so uncommon to have your dog off-leash on the trails in the forest. So we let Amber run and do her thing. She was a good dog, and never ran off too far, or too long, or jumped on people. She did love people though. And speaking of people, we had not seen anyone else on the trail after about two miles in on the hike. Which was nice since it was just all of us talking, laughing, and enjoying nature. My best friend and I started a hike ahead of everyone else because we were so energized and excited about finding the first and best tent spot once we got to the lake. Amber was bounding ahead of us and having a great time too. We were about 20 yards ahead of my parents when Amber stopped dead in her tracks. I thought she maybe saw a chipmunk or something, maybe a bird. But her hackle shot up and she began letting out the lowest hum of a growl I've ever heard. She never growls. So we stopped walking, and I thought maybe a bear or a deer or something was just off the trail, and she had seen or heard it. We immediately started walking backwards, and my parents caught up to us. My dad asked us what was going on. I told him that Amber is up the trail and is growling at something. He tells his girls to stay back with my mom, and he walks ahead to where Amber was at on the trail. My dad gets up to her and looks around. I hear Amber whimper a bit while looking off the trail. My dad gets her to settle and calls her back and walks back to us. He says it must have been an animal, but he didn't see anything right off the trail or ahead of us. He says to let him take the lead and we continue our hike. It didn't take long before it was forgotten and Amber and the rest of us were all back to having a good time again. We arrived at the lake and much to my delight, there was no one else there camping. The water was clean and blue and the shade from the trees made the whole scene just perfect. My friend and I found the best spot to set up our tents, and my parents followed suit. After we had camp set up, my folks went off to fish just down the hill, and my friend and I took off with Amber to walk around to the other side of the lake to catch salamanders. We only made it about an eighth of a mile when Amber stopped and began to growl again. We stopped and looked around and heard brush rustling. Then. Right in front of us, a man just walked out of the trees. Amber stayed right by our sides and started to bare her teeth. He was taller than my dad, so at least six foot four, very skinny, but he had very broad shoulders. He was clean cut and was wearing black jeans and a white polo shirt with loafers. I mean, he didn't look like he had hiked at all or was even dressed for the outdoors. He almost looked like he came out of church. We just stood there trying to process this situation when Amber began to bark. The guy just stood there, not moving, and then he smiled. Like the creepiest, off-putting smile you can think of. It felt like someone who thought that was what a smile was supposed to look like, but it just felt off. Amber kept barking 
and this got my parents' attention. So they looked up to us and called out for us to come back. We complied and started to walk back towards them. My dad met us halfway and told us to go back to the campsite and then he was heading to talk to this guy. We got back to our camp and my mom sat with us. I could hear my dad asking if the guy needed help or was he a fellow camper who had just set up camp away from the lake. My dad was being polite and calm, but I could see he was on guard and trying to feel out the situation. Now is a good time to mention that my dad was ex-army and he can be very intimidating when needed. The conversation continued. The guy told my dad he was just on a walk and did not mean to intrude on us. The man then says goodbye and walks right back into the woods. My dad strolls back to the camp, sits down, and told us that he thinks that the guy may just be a yuppie camper and doesn't know much about the outdoors. But my dad said that he got a weird vibe off of him and would be keeping an eye out for him the rest of our stay. Amber stayed by our side and was now calm, yet she kept looking towards the direction that the guy went off in. A bit more time goes by and we have a nice campfire going as the sun began to set. We cooked some dinner and made s'mores afterwards. My friend and I decided to go to our tent and read some books, maybe tell each other some scary stories I can't remember. Amber followed us to the tent and laid right outside the door. My parents walked down to the lake to sit, have a beer, and just chill. They were never more than 50 yards away from us. But not long after my parents walked away, I hear Amber start to growl. Then we hear footsteps coming from the woods behind our tent. My friend and I turn off our flashlight and go quiet to listen. The footsteps stopped at the edge of the woods. We then hear heavy breathing and a grunting sound. Amber starts to bark and we then hear the footsteps retreat back to the woods. Amber whimpers a bit and then I hear my parents walking back to the camp. I go out to tell them what happened. My dad said that he heard Amber barking and that's why they came back up. I asked my dad what we should do. What is going on and if that strange guy was the one creeping around? He tells me that he will see about moving camp in the morning since we still have three days left on the trip and nothing has happened to warrant just leaving but he said that we will play it by ear and just be a little more vigilant but if something changes then we'll decide what to do next. He tells us to try to get some sleep and we all turn in for the night. The next morning, we get up and have breakfast. After breakfast, we head down to the lake to fish. It was an absolutely beautiful day, and we were having so much fun that the events from the prior day were all but forgotten. We decided around lunchtime that we would go for a short hike to the waterfall that is up from the lake. We were gone for maybe an hour, and then we came back. But we found our tents opened, and our sleeping bags drug out on the ground. My dad tells us to hang back with mom, and he heads forward to investigate. He comes back and says nothing was missing, but it was not an animal that did this. He says we should break camp, hike back to the car and find another spot to camp for the next couple of days. I could tell my dad was not wanting to frighten us, but I heard the urgency in his voice. I was very disappointed, but if it meant we could enjoy the rest of the trip and not worry about some creep messing with us, then it was worth it. We broke camp and started our hike back. Dad was in the lead, and we were double-timing it. Made it back to the car in record time. As we walk over to the car, we see that one of our tires was flat. Not a big deal, we always had a spare. But when my dad bent down to start taking the lugs off, it was not just flat, but someone had slashed the tire. Dad changed the tire in record time, and we threw everything into the car. And he goes to turn the car on, but it wouldn't start. Dad hops out of the car, pops the hood to investigate. That's when we hear him say, Shit. Turns out that our spark plug wires were missing. Old cars like that Chevy wagon did not have internal hood releases. You could just pop the hood from the outside. Dad slams the hood down, says some very colorful words, and kicks some rocks. We were stuck out there, and no one else was at the trailhead. We were officially stranded. My parents are calm under pressure, and after a few minutes of discussion, it was decided that dad would start walking down the road until he could hitch a ride to town and head to the auto parts store. Mom and the rest of us were going to wait with the car and look for someone 
to hopefully pull into the trailhead and help us. A few hours go by, and no one has come up the trailhead. It's getting hot, and we're all hungry and tired. My mom makes us some lunch, and we go to sit under a tree to cool off. Amber is by our side, and calm. But then we hear a voice. Amber leaps up and starts to whimper. It's the creepy guy from yesterday coming down the trail, and he's asking my mom if we need help. My mom tells him that we're fine, that it's being settled by my dad and he'll be back soon. This creep then tells her that his camp is close, and he is parked on the old fire road that is near the lake, and asks us if we would like to come back to his camp and wait until my dad returns. Mom sternly tells him no, that we'll just wait for him here. Thank you anyway, though. He doesn't like this. He tells my mom that it's not safe out here for a pretty lady and two young girls. My mom, like my dad, is no pushover and asserts herself again that we don't need any help and to please just leave us alone. The guy just stands there, smiles wide, and then turns around and leaves. My mom is visibly shaken by this, and us girls are just a bit scared too. My mom comes over to us and tells us that we need to stay close, do not wander, and that we'll be okay. My friend and I are really kind of freaked out and are just hoping that my dad will make it back soon. After about another 30 minutes, the creepy guy comes back again. This time though, he's not alone and has a slightly younger guy with him. The other guy is dressed as a yuppie camper and had a very stern look on his face. My mother stands her ground as they approach. Amber starts to low growl and her hackles go right up. The two guys flank us and one of them flashes a gun tucked into his belt. The older guy tells us that we need to go with them and that they're not asking. My mom backs up next to us and without taking her eyes off them, reaches to her belt and pulls out her bowie knife. My mom said we will not be going and that they need to leave now. The two men didn't even flinch at this and said that we will come with them or they'll have to hurt us. At this moment though, Amber goes from just growling to barking and puts herself between us and them. This makes the guys stop. My mom yells that they need to leave now. They start backing up, and at that moment we hear a truck pulling into the trailhead parking lot. At the sight of the truck, the guys begin to walk away fast and disappear right into the tree line. The truck was a forest ranger, and he had my dad with him. My dad jumped out of the truck and ran over to us, asking if we were okay. The ranger came with him and inquired as to who those men were. My mom explained everything while my dad hugged us girls and told us that we were okay. That's when the ranger took off to go looking for those guys. My dad tells us that he was about five miles from town when the ranger picked him up and took him the rest of the way to get the part for the car, before hanging around and giving my dad a return trip to us and the car. After hearing what happened, my dad was pissed and wanted to find the guys who had tried to kidnap us and that had been terrorizing us for the past 24 hours. The ranger came back and told us that he had almost caught up with them, but they sped away in their truck with a camper in tow. They had been parked behind a small ridge behind the lake on an old logging road. He wasn't able to get their plate, but he radioed a description of the men in their truck to the local sheriff's office. He also took down our information and said he would pass it on to them. The ranger waited with us until dad had the car fixed and we were able to leave. We decided to not continue camping and instead drive a couple of hours to spend the last two days of the trip at the beach and stay in a hotel. A few days later, a deputy called my dad and told him they never did find those men. He said that it was most likely a crime of opportunity after seeing a woman with two girls in tow. He was sure they had been watching us from off the trail and had messed with our camp to judge how my dad would react. When my dad seemed to be too big of a threat, they sabotaged our car hoping to put us in a position where we would be vulnerable. The deputy said they would follow up with us if they find out anything else. But according to my dad, nothing ever came of it. Years later, I tried to do some research on crimes in that area of Oregon during the 80s that might have involved something like we experienced. All I could find was a few reports of campers being robbed and a few cars broken into. There was one case of a young lady and her dog going missing from an area near there, but it was never determined what had happened to her, or even if it was something bad, or she just ran away. 
I can tell you that we did go back to that lake a few years later and had a very uneventful camping trip. It was nice to go back and find some joy in a spot that was oh so special to me. I really hope those creepy guys never hurt anyone, and maybe they were caught for other crimes. I'll never know though. I just hope to never run into a situation like that again. I can say that having a dog along with us helped our situation. She was the hero and kept us alert. Amber went on to live until she was 12 years old and passed with her favorite people around her. Remember to stay safe, stay watchful, and it never hurts to have a sweet, brave dog with you. Here's a bit of relevant context for this story. I grew up about 15 miles outside of downtown Portland in a semi-rural area. We lived on a windy country road in the hills where the homes were spread quite a distance apart. Our closest neighbor was maybe a 10 minute walk away. Our house was set back off the road and had a gravel driveway that took a sharp turn so you couldn't see the house from the road and vice versa. One warm spring day when I was about 10, I was riding the bus home from school. As the bus squeaked to a stop at my driveway, I looked out the window to my left and saw a man in a gray pickup truck idling alongside the road. I remember that both the truck and the man looked weathered and unfamiliar to me. He had parked his truck perpendicular to my driveway, almost blocking it. Being so young, I thought nothing of it. But when I got to the front of the bus, the driver held her arm out blocking me from going any further. Do you recognize that truck or that man? I told her no. At that point, she opened her sliding window and motioned for him to move it along. He looked right back at her and then looked back ahead and didn't move. He wasn't looking at a map or anything, just sitting there. The bus driver then got on the intercom and told him that he needed to move, but he continued to do his best to ignore her, all the while staying put. Then she said, Sir, you best move along. I'm not going anywhere until you're out of here. This must have been the final straw for him. He finally left, and after a few minutes the bus driver let me out, and she said she would wait several more minutes for me to get up the driveway and into my house. I told my mom what happened as soon as I got home, and the next morning she came with me to catch the bus, and to thank the bus driver. I believe she gave her some sort of gift, but I'm not exactly sure. After that incident, my mom and stepdad hollowed out a section of the trees at the end of our driveway as a hiding spot. In that spot, my siblings and I could watch the road while waiting for the bus in the mornings while nobody else could see us. Anyway, this incident gives me chills when I think back. If my bus driver hadn't been so vigilant in looking out for me, and if that man in the pickup had been up to no good, I would have walked right into whatever he had planned. Right after my driveway, there is a sharp turn and a steep downhill, and the bus would have been out of sight within seconds. No doubt, there would have been no witnesses to whatever that man had plotted 